Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Daryl Robert Schoon. Daryl is an author and speaker known for his writings on the economy, gold, and the crisis that currently faces humanity. He graduated from college in 1966 with a degree in political science, then entered law school, but soon dropped out to live in the Haight-Ashbury, where he became a member of the hippie subculture in San Francisco. Since then, his articles on the economy have been widely published on the web, and he has spoken before audiences in the USA, Europe, and Australia, and on TV. His current focus includes spirituality, metaphysics, and economics. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. We hope you enjoyed the conversation between Paul and Daryl Robert Schoon as they discuss his new book, Docking at the Mothership. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have one of the most interesting, wise, highly developed, highly informative human beings I've ever come across in my life. His name's Daryl Shoon. We're going to get to know Daryl on this podcast. He's got a wealth of knowledge on money, the issues of the world. He has had a very profound journey of spiritual development. I saw him with Regina Meredith on Open Minds, which is, as most of you know, one of my favorite shows because I have deep respect for Regina and her husband, Zeus, and they always have great guests. And I sat and watched Daryl with awe. In fact, I have a Justin Irani who works here at the farm with us. I made him sit down and said, you've got to listen to what Daryl's saying. This guy really knows what he's talking about. So... I took a shot, reached out to Zeus, asked if there's any way I could get connected to Daryl, and here we are. Daryl, welcome to Living 4D. I'm really grateful to have you here. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's exciting to be able to uh, tap into some of your wisdom. And uh, Daryl, you've written how many books now? I know I've just had the pleasure written, of looking I, at, I, I've at your new one. I think maybe I think I and I've got another one coming out. I, I've, I've written six, and yet yeah, including my new one. I don't okay. keep track of them. You know, right. just, it's something I do. You know, every yeah, good. Yeah, I know I know what you mean. Well, you know, we've had a chance to go back and forth a little in preparation for the podcast. And, and you know, what, what I wanted to talk to you about was some of the deeper underlying themes about what's going on in the world, because I think people keep coming at it sort of a problem solution, taking the top off of the weed. And I, I found listening to your interview that you have had time to really deeply explore not only the issues of the day, but the spiritual roots of them. And that led me to wanting to talk to you about myth and why myth is important to understand. And in my research, spiritual research and study, I found myth, which I equate to dreaming, comes before mind in the unfolding of source, meaning that for those listening, that God can't be thinking things into existence because that's a duality. And if we if we equate God to unconditional love or the absolute, the closest expression to the absolute would be the infinite, which is still uh, not a duality. If anything, it's a unity. And so the way I perceive this is that the only way God can know itself is to look into itself. And in the act of looking into itself, God creates characters, which then begin to have relationships. So anytime you have two points of consciousness, now you have a flow of energy and information, which creates a mind. So it seems that the stories that we believe and tell and encapsulate or create the container within which we perceive reality or we, we think of them as our thoughts and our ideas, but I think they're really the expressions of a deeper myth and COVID and the world transition we're uh, in has been a very powerful amplifier of our unconscious and conscious stories within which our individual ego mind seems to rationalize and judge itself, others, the situation. Those of us with life experience and understanding of myth on the grand scale 
um, and how COVID gave us a chance to reevaluate our story in the context of events, either found ourselves adhering to our values to, that support ourselves within the context of our own myth, our, our, i.e. our values are an expression of our myth. And we saw a lot of people revert backwards to their childhood programming. For example, I saw a lot of yogis that were very holistic and you know, the kind of people you would never think would run out and get an untested vaccine with no indications of what it is on the label and all the secrecy. And next thing you know, they're lining up and getting vaccinated and then acting like they never studied yoga or anything at all. So we see this classic reversion in consciousness uh, when stress is uh, in our presence. And so then you see people trying to fit in and, and, uh, you know, do what they think they've got to do to survive based on what everybody else is doing. So sheep herd mentality. But because life is an evolutionary process, is a process, those that revert are resisting the flow of the now. In other words, if you go backwards, your consciousness is going back to an older structure, but we're in the presence of something that's extremely new and novel, like what's happening right now which for me is kind of like trying to push water uphill. If, you, if you're using older ideas for a new problem, to me, that doesn't seem like a good formula. So where I'd like to start with you, Daryl, and your wisdom is how do you engage myth? How important is myth? And what suggestions do you have to help people consciously engage and take adult ownership of their story and assess if their story is open to the forms of change that are driving things, our evolutionary process, or are they in need of a myth update? I know that's a lot, but I, I, I suspect you get where I'm going because I really picked up that you have had plenty of time to engage your own personal myth as well as the myths that people tell themselves in the world. And I just was burning to get into this with you. Um. Very deep question. <laughs> I mean, it is. And what I'd like to do is, is is take step back and 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 go back to how we first entered this experience. And myth is a term that you could use to explain it, yeah. all right, or how it impacts us. Now, what I would like to say in reference to that is my my thought is is that is that we come in here knowing zero. I mean, perhaps in myth, we know everything. Perhaps in the reality that truly is, we are and know everything. But when we enter this plane as discrete, individualized, apparently separate, egoic personalities, we enter blind. I mean, blind. And then the data starts coming. It just starts coming. Now, everybody, and, and, and the thing is, is that the data comes in and is different for everybody. All right? Your sister, you, you can have a twin. It doesn't matter if you share the same womb. All right? Because not only is the data coming into each of you, it may be the same, but the way you're processing it is different. If you're a guy and your twin is this girl, she's going to process it totally. You may be the same astrological sign. But the gender perception and filter of the incoming data is going to be different. And what we do is we begin to think, we be, our ground zero, which is us, we think is neutral. It's not. Our ground zero is loaded. It's loaded like a, I mean, it's loaded. It's like, like a video that you're slipping in. All right? But we don't know it because we're at the effect of it. The, the 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 person born with the in the sign of Leo who likes to lead and talk and do these things he just thinks that's the normal way of being he thinks other people who are sitting back or are just they're insecure he'll make all these judgments about them and the person who's who's sitting back is looking at the Leo going what a show off yes all right because we have all these we each have our own thing now my sense Paul is this my prayer. My uh, of gratitude is I've been wrong about everything. <laughs> I mean, if I had been right about it, we'd be up. We'd be fucked. <laughs> I mean, if I if I was right about my how I saw this, 
It's, it's only lately, Paul, that I can look at a child and feel, oh, it's wonderful. Oh, you're here. I used to look at that thing and go, Psh, man, you have no. I mean, I consider myself lucky. And it's been harrowing. All right. When I was, I watch people, I go, you know, people must have a very low bar of what you think, of what, you know, I mean, most people are afraid of death, not because life has been so good, because they're afraid of cessation. It isn't that they've had this wonderful life where they've been cared for and nurtured and, and, and brought up and, and, and flowered. No, each one of us grew up into a, basically a familial dysfunction. <laughs> Some <laughs> level or another, <laughs> of Dude. which we of which we've been individually and culturally in reaction to ever since. Yes, yeah. What what you made me think of is the fish that doesn't know it's in water, right? Oh, oh, yeah. And and what happens is it's it's so onto its path that it. You know what? I'm like that fish that's finally beginning to go. Wow, I'm not going to sink. <laughs> and I'm 77, Paul, and yeah. I just reached that thing. Oh, I don't have to worry about sinking. <laughs> well, I think it's great because if you're 77 and you got this much fire in you, there's hope for me and a lot of us. <laughs> Man, I, you know, I I have realized, and, and I tend to be very judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real good. All right, I mean. It's not a good way to be, but I, you know, like I, I click, all right? And one of the books I read about judgment, it was from source, I absolutely believe, said, you have made judgments about reality because it, it's out of your control. And your judgments give you a sense of control. You explain it to yourself and you reach your judgment. The problem is when you make a judgment, it locks reality or the phenomena of life into a pattern that you can't see, but you become a victim to. So what we all become victim to is our own judgments without knowing it because they're invisible. We believe our judgments are absolutely true. The fundamentalist Muslim is no more shaken by the belief of fundamental Jew or an atheist or a libertarian, each one believes themselves. I, you know, I thought the one thing that joins us may not be love. I mean, I think it is, all right? But on the other hand, the other thing that we all have in common, everybody thinks they're right. <laughs> you know? Well, we have two things in common now. <laughs> yeah, everybody thinks they're right. And in fact, I, 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 had, I, made, I was having this talk. My, I, my kids are incredible. I, I was talking with my son. And I, and I said, you know, I'm trying to impart my wisdom you know, crap, in a job. I said, you know, Benjamin, I said, it'd be a lot, people would go and get a lot more out of life if instead of saying, I think, they said, I guess. And you know what he answered was? Yes. But instead they say, I know. Yes. Okay. Now, my kid said that. When I was trying to make the point, but let me tell you how he caught me on the backside. This is when I, after I got out of prison, we're making the bed, you know, and stuff like that. And I said, you know, Benjamin, I said, what passes off as wisdom is very often due to inflection. And he said, you said that wrong, dad. <laughs> All right. So in other words, the way you say things makes you appear wise. And he goes, <laughs> you said that wrong, Ted. In other words, I used my inflection was not it didn't pass muster. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that that's where I see our predicament. All right? That it's so encompassing. One of the statements I made in the book is, how can you tell what is true when the world only reflects what you think? And everyone's getting a feedback that's coherent to them. And it absolutely rings true to them. And what we do is we look at each other with people who don't agree with ours and we're having trouble in the world and we go, the reason I'm having this trouble is that person over there who thinks otherwise. Now that's universal. So here we are, but that's that's just where we find ourselves. Now, 
I am the most hopeful I have ever been in my life. That's fantastic. I think so too. But I've come a long way. Like I said. Uh, well, you've had some time. <laughs> yeah, I've had some time. And I really, like I said, I, I'm a person who jumps to conclusions. And the conclusion that I started out with, this is fuck. I mean, we're outnumbered. Every, we're, we're, we don't have enough data. It's all, the world's against us. It's moving in a direction. And I'm powerless. All right? In, in a very deep way. Very deep way. I'm powerless. And what, right? what age were you having this thought? It was when I, I think that was formed by my, my childhood with my father. Right, but you're you're speaking about this, and and I'm trying to find where in yeah, the context exactly. and then of I your come life. To these conclusions. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, see, the thing is, is that everybody has, out of the get go, has their own personal path, and it's a path, and we think it's neutral. It's it's not. In fact, it's purposive. All right, and it it may be the most hellacious, horrible thing that you would go in retrospect. I would never choose to do that, Paul. I think at one level we did choose. But that's not the level here. So we each find ourselves on a path that is front loaded with problems, with, 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 with trauma, and with only a glimpse and the possibility of resolution and love. All right? Oh, I mean, only, uh, only hope for, no, no certainty. All right? right? Yeah. And that I have moved on this in, in a way. That and and the one thing is I I don't think I lie to myself as I mean we all sort of tell these things but I'm pretty clear in my sense I believe that I look at things I go what is this what is that all right I mean you know when I was when when I brought out my book and I made the prediction about the collapse in two thousand and in you know, two thousand and seven and the collapse happened one year later the book was called Time of the Vulture. And it was my friend from law school, Marshall Thurber, had brought all these people together. It's a very high-powered people, all right? And um, uh, we had a uh, one of the guests at the time who he teletalk, you know, gave his talk to. Then we could ask some questions. Was um, he was uh, he he wrote a book called Super Forecasting? Okay, Philip Tetlock, all right. I mean, he he's the expert on predictions, all right. And the reason how he got to this level was. He was a, a, a professor of political science in the 1970s at UC Berkeley, and you know, so he's you know he's got some crit, you know, credibility, and so he started an experiment. He wrote all these people, experts in their field, uh, media people, professors, whoever, and said, "How do you think the Cold War is going to end?" All right. Well, 1992, the Soviet Union collapsed. In itself, 1991, 92, okay? So now he had a, 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 the answer that nobody had when he asked the question. And he could go through everybody's answers and see who was right, who was wrong, and who was further away. And what he found was the ones who really aired the most were the uh, pundits, the experts. All right? <laughs> no surprise. No surprise. But the reason they are, quote, experts and have followed is they voice other people's feelings. Hopes and fears. We all have the ones we listen to because they reflect. I was in Berkeley. And there was a a yogi, a, a Buddhist monk, and everybody knew he had a drinking problem. All right, I mean, sort of became aware. Well, you know what? The boy, the guys, the people that like to drink and smoke pot. He was their favorite teacher. Yeah, you know, he's he's my rinpoche. All right. Yeah. Uh huh. All right. I mean, that's what we do. That's how we make it through this thing. Well, what happened is. He came in and he 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 had us take a test, all right, on 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 predictive ability. I got the highest score possible. Great, zero deviation, all right, in the whole in the group, and we had some very interesting people in that group. But the reason how he he said this is how he, he came to his conclusions and why he created the test. He said basically, we have our our the way we approach life is either from the point of view of the hedgehog which a lot of people are, they're ideologues, they're religions, or they're atheists. It doesn't matter. You hold, you have a, a, a pit, big picture. You hold A it. belief system? A belief system that you very hold to, okay? And then the other thing, you have the fox who's looking at data constantly, moving around quickly, moving, to okay? And he said, neither the fox 
nor the hedgehog over the time is going to be that correct. Because the hedgehog, the fox is moving way too much, all right? And the hedgehog is trying to fit everything into his box. He said, the people who make the best predictions have a combination of the hedgehog and the fox in them. They have a framework from that they've evolved in themselves, but they're watching the data. And they will not commit until they think it doesn't. Now, what I believe is this. Because people want life to be a certain way, they bet beforehand. Ah, uh, they go. That's it. Because mm-hmm. they want it. Yeah. Or they're and I'm not saying anything about why they want it. There's a lot of good hearted people in this world, a lot of mean people in this world, but they they will do that. And I got zero deviation because I scored highest on that floating test, on that on that thing. So I've gone through this process of life. I think it's the way I approach it. And you asked the question, how did I come to this very dour, negative view of life? And I said, I drew it back to my father, who I love dearly now. All right. But growing uh, up, it was war. I mean, I, I, it was war, Paul. I and know I, the deal. I had one of those. And here I am in, at 22 years old in the Haight-Ashbury. I just dropped out of law school. I began to eat acid, you know, and I meet this guy who's doing astrology charts. I find out later he was an ex teaching assistant at UC Berkeley. All right. Uh-huh. Living in Haight Ashbury doing charts. All right. So he does my chart. He's all what's he doing? Does my chart. And he says, This person, which is me, this aspect, they will have a conflict with one of their parents, probably the father. I now I thought before he said that, before that day, that astrology was a bunch of hippie bullshit. All these hippies seem to believe it. I'm living on Hate Street. And then I have a chance fine. We're done. You know, I'm a year out of law school. I don't believe it. Okay? He does my wife's chart at the time. All right? Um, this person will be separated from one of their parents at an early age, leaving them very insecure. Her mother died when she was 12, and she was just never got over it. That's two out of two. I mean, that's two out of two at a very deep level. That's not saying, this is going to be a good year for you. You know? It, none of that. This was... This was bullseye. Yeah. bullseye. So I leave his house in the Hate Ashbury. I'm walking back to now. By the time I got to my house, I had come to two conclusions, Paul. One, if astrology was true, because I couldn't say it was. I mean, the day before, I thought it was a bunch of crap. But now I got the whole, I got the door blown off. Mm-hmm. All right. He was hanging by his hinge. I couldn't put it back together. And I, I know a lot of people who would, and a lot of people do because they, they're they afraid of that door swinging like that. They don't like uncertainty. That's why we hold, that's why, Paul, we hold on to things. That's why we grasp at things. There's a sense of desperation and fear that's lurking in us that drives us to believe the untenable and just hang on when all the evidence is going against it. It's survival, and it's in us. All right. And the other thing that came to me was this by the time I got home. If astrology was true, there's a connection between each and every one of us and the universe. Why? Totally. Because if I had a chart that explained my life before I lived it. So did you. So did people I didn't know. And I had that chart before I knew about it. And so what that did, plus LS acid and all those, you know, kicked the reality that I believe to be true out from under me in a major way. When you talked about rites of passage, it was that that time in the Haight-Ashbury. It just challenged at level. People can't believe, and I can't believe, what that period was like. I just went through it, all right? And it was intense. It, it may be romantic on the backside. I, I have a sense, Paul, that life in the 20s in Paris wasn't all fun and games. You know, we romanticize it, the artists, the free love that thought. I mean, they were catching crabs. They were getting in fights with each other. They had no money. They were a little scuffling. But it was a time of intense change. Yes. Things were afoot. All right? They were being changed. They were being changed. What I believe, Paul, is this. We are being changed. My belief, my profound belief and faith that this is going to turn out is not based upon people, per se, our egoic separate. I don't trust 
people. I don't really trust myself. I don't trust my mind. I know how we operate. I know how we're moved. I know how, what we're working through. But it, I know about it. And I know that it, whether we know it or not, is we're a part of it. And it is only has the highest in mind that it, though it appears at certain points, the worst is about to happen. All right? Yes. And I know there's free will involved, but not where we think it is. Where do you think it is? I think part of it was triggered before we came. All right? That that before we incarnated this time, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in reincarnation. All Me right? too. Yeah, I do I too. I believe that we come, you know, we take on gender. Culture, all right, um, personality, astrological symbols, all right. We've all been the asshole. We've been the criminal. We've been the the judge. We've been the pious, pious prick. Yeah, we've know? been the whole tarot the twenty-two whole, because arcana. Because the soul is trying to learn about it. Yes, We're here. Yeah. So it, we are a part of that of our souls. Mm -hmm. All right. We're the extension of that, though we don't know of it. And I certainly didn't know of it when I came into it, but my life, I've been so lucky. I have been so lucky, Paul, that things have come my way at the right time in the right way for me to see it in the way that I see it. I remember when I was in, in, in you know, at the time of my restaurant in Berkeley and one of my friends who I, I'm still in contact with now, this, these are, you know, we're getting long in tooth. <laughs> And, and he was really sort of famous. He had written a book on VW repair. You know, we're all hippies, you know. Uh, and 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 I saw him playing with this kid, and you know, my wife was pregnant, you know, with our first. And he said, you know, Daryl, I tell you how it's how it is, but you wouldn't get it anyway, so I'm not gonna say anything. That's so funny. He was pro profound as hell. I mean, that's profound. Uh, okay. I mean, that is flat out profound. All right. Now that was the period where we were looking for stuff, where everything was in flux, all right? It wasn't settled. And, 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 but what I now know, Paul, is that, is that this, and it's because, oh, what I was saying, the, the digression was this. I, he, he was, you know, when I met, you know, we were talking about Jeffrey Mishlov earlier. Yeah. All right? This has got to be in around 73, all right? You know what my thought, and I only told Jeffrey this last year in one of the interviews. I said, you know, Jeffrey, one of my thoughts about you in the 70s was, wow, this guy has read more than me. <laughs> He's read a lot. <laughs> and I had read a whole lot by that time, too. Because once I realized that I didn't know that something like as bizarre as astrology was more was that was more real than Kretschmer's endomorph and mesomorph explanation of personality. Yes. That that I had something as bizarre as that held perhaps held more water and asked more questions. It really, I mean, and I'm living in Hate Ashbury, and stuff was coming in and stuff was there. It was flowing. I look back at those words that people were singing, and they're holy. Smile on your brother, love one another. You hold the key to the world in your palm. You know. Yes. I don't know if Jesse Colin Young knew what was he was saying any more than than he than I knew what I was listening to it. I mean, I I read stuff that came through me in prison, and I'm only now getting it in a full sense. But I wrote it, and it came to me. I knew it. It was there. It was locked in. And then I moved away from it. The mind came back. The op opacity came back. My duality came back. And so what I believe is each of us is where we are because we're supposed to be. Not because of where we want to be, but because where we're supposed to be. And I know how uncertain it all looks. I've, I've known uncertainty. Yeah. Right? I mean, there was a line, uh, I forget the guy wrote, he, it was a wonderful line. He said, the difference between an adventurer and a suicide is that the adventurer always leaves himself a margin of safety. And the narrower the margin, the greater the adventure. Yes. Jung, Jung says no man is fully alive until he has the power to destroy himself. And I think that we should all be dancing in the streets based on that idea. Well, 
I, I think what has happened is that we've reached the point where it, the universe, is staging an intervention. I, I absolutely believe that. I, I've had the feeling for decades, Paul, decades, that, you know, when you reach the end of a chapter, of a paragraph, you know, sort of cleans itself up. And when you reach the end of a chapter, that part is done. Another one starts. And when you reach the end of the book, the book's done. And then there's things called volumes, sets. And when the set is done, that epic is done. All right? Mm-hmm. I believe absolutely 100% we're at the end of something that has never ended before. Things are resolving themselves that have been askew since the very beginning of what we call or know as creation. All right? Imbalances that have been there from the very beginning. All right? And, 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 one of my, you know, these things are called paradigms, you know, like, you know. Yeah, sure. A paradigm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of my thoughts about paradigm shifts is the longer a paradigm has been in effect and the deeper its cultural roots are, the more traumatic and disruptive the change. This is why we're going through this thing of gender right now, because the dynamic, the imbalance between the masculine and feminine has been there since the beginning of creation. Before creation, it was all one. They each was a part of it. But when it moved into and took that step, quote, all hell broke loose. And the polarities pulled back into places that were that they were stunned into. And they've been with us ever since. And what is happening now is that it's rebalancing. It's coming together in a way that it never did. That's why I believe that our generation, our parents' generation, had so much trouble with relationships because there were there, there were issues there for us to heal, for us to heal. The terror of loneliness, the, the feeling of not being in control, mirrored back to us by the other spiritual dynamic, by the other polarity which triggered in us that which we needed to move. And we will either heal that in ourselves or find another person to bring that up in us because the purpose is to heal at this time. Now, the free will comes in our resistance. And also, we're not all at the same place, all right? I mean, we're at different levels of the evolution of what is unfolding. And you cannot expect an entity at one level to be moving through the entity at another level. For a, for example, in my life, things that were true at one point were not true later. We like to think black and white is black and white. Eh, that's when you can't see the gradation. That's because you can't see the grayscale. Yes. Right? Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to announce our new live show called PT 3.0 that will be available to you at youtube.com forward slash check institute. That's C-H-E-K Institute. Each PT 3.0 episode will be offered every first and third Wednesday of the month and is a 30-minute live show designed specifically to help exercise professionals and anyone who wants to use exercise scientifically in their practices. The host of the show will be a Czech faculty member, a high-level practitioner, or an industry expert that is aligned with Czech principles, and each show offers us the following free bonus materials. A Q&A segment at the end of the episode a downloadable reference guide to help audience members apply what they've learned. We call this PT 3.0 because the purpose of the show is to provide next generation training to personal trainers and to help them evolve in their practice. PT 3.0 is a web show designed to provide 30 minutes of intense, essential training to personal trainers and strength coaches that will make an instant impact on their business and practice. This is not a webinar or a podcast, but a fully produced online show featuring a live host and high-quality footage of assessments, exercises, stretches, and program design together with Q&A for targeted bite-sized education. Each episode will be highly focused, training, for example, one assessment or one program design technique or one stretch, etc. Each episode will be broadcast live on our YouTube channel, and the show is 
free. Hallelujah. Each episode will be recorded and available to you on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Czech Institute. And again, it's completely free. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for notification when each episode begins by going to youtube.com forward slash Czech Institute. To see our upcoming episode schedule and to receive advanced notifications of all episodes, go to pt 3 dot checkinstitute.com. Once again, to see our upcoming episode schedule and receive advanced notification for all episodes, go to pt3.checkinstitute.com. We hope you enjoy this live show. I remember like positive thinking, affirmations, all right? My experience with that came in 1973 before the Shakti Gawain ever wrote her book, all right? <laughs> Data visualization, all right? This is 70, yeah. all right? And my friend Marshall from law school, who never smoked, never drank, driven to succeed, and I'm his hippie friend, like, you know? I mean, we're like this. He calls me up, and this is after my restaurant broke, you know? I met Jeffrey, and I am, I mean, I am broke. Marshall said, Daryl, I'm broke too. I said, Marshall, you're broke in wingtip brogues. You're <laughs> broke in There's a difference. <laughs> right? So Marshall, burning with a desire to improve his lot in life, he's an Aries, all right? He had seen this ad in the newspaper called The Lazy Man's Way to Riches. Well, Marshall wasn't lazy. He's driven. I mean, driven, Paul. Okay? But he wanted to get rich. And it's a $10 money-back guarantee. That's like $50 today, all right? Money-back guarantee. Marshall sends away for the book. I don't know. Calls me up. Daryl, you got to read this book. I want you to read it. So I go over his house because we're, you know, we're like this. You know, I've been through the hate ashbury all this stuff. and reading esoteric tomes, you know, to, you know, the, the blue books from Alice A. Bailey, the Arancho yeah. book, you know, Master DK, Kutumi, you know, the Masters, you know, yeah. and all of this stuff. And Here's a book called Lazy Man's Way to Riches. I read it, Paul. I go, this is so close to Roberto Ossigioli's The Act of Will, of using your mind to create, except this guy's a used car salesman. But he had it down. And he even said, I don't understand why this works. Somebody handed me a piece of paper, and I'm a multimillionaire. You know? And I did it through direct mail. But I don't think that's the deal. I think there was this piece of paper. And this is what this book is about. So Marshall wrote out his goals. I did mine. We sat there. I never saw his list. He never saw my list. This is 1973. Three years later, Paul, Marshall's living in a mansion next to Diane Feinstein. He's got a Rolls Royce, a Corvette. He's given money to the people who are going to pr promote the Course in Miracles. Is he All still right? wearing his wingtips? <laughs> Yes, he is. All right. Yeah. In fact, you as a you as a uh, seminar leader would love this. You would love. You would see this. Before I went to prison in '85 for my ten years, I'm at Marshall's gold mine. All right, and we're buds. You know, he's you know we're friends. All right. He's about to fly out of Nevada to do this seminar. He was big time thing back on the East Coast. All right, and he's polishing his shoes in the morning. Okay, is it we're at three or four in the morning? And then he realizes just in time that he has got a dark Cordovan wingtip next to a brown wingtip, and he was going to put him in the set. Like, big faux pas. All yeah. right? Two yeah. different shoes on. Uh -huh. You know? And he said, boy, I'm glad I caught that. And he said, come on, Marshall. I know you. If you had put these on, you're in your suit, you're walking around in front of that crowd, you've got them in the palm of your hands, you're talking about esoteric stuff, you've got to throw them, and somebody points out that you're wearing – you shoot, you know, like, hey, Mark, Mr. Thurber, uh, it looks like you got a brown shoe on and a reddish brown shoe on. What you would do is this. You'd stop, you'd look at your shoes, realize that they're right, and turn to the audience and go, I was waiting for somebody to notice that. Yeah. <laughs> the reason why I am wearing two colored shoes is because we are a dual consciousness. <laughs> and go yeah. off this some smart, you know. Thing yeah. like that. Okay? So, Marshall, here we were. This, that, that was 85, okay? This is 73. He's living next to Diane Feinstein, 
I mean, this how you know he's got he's a, on his way to become a multimillionaire. I'm living on, ten years before I was living on you on, on, on Hastings. Ten years later, I'm living on Union Street, very upscale district in San Francisco. All right, I have a little karma here because I'm a hippie, and I got serious amounts of money because so the my book worked for both of you. But I became it was in the drug business. Marshall's in the drug business. <laughs> I didn't go. I'm gonna you, but you do affirmations. You don't say how you're gonna get there. You see yourself there. Yes. You see yourself there. And I did. Oh, I don't owe anything. My debts are paid. I've got the, you know, like, it was desperation when you've yeah. been as broke as I am. But this is what happens. This is what I'm saying, how things change. Why you do one thing at one time and not another. So that's why telling people, I've always said it's a little problematical. All right. 1976, I'm living. I'm married. I've got two wonderful kids. I've got enough money for the, I mean, serious money. All right. I am retired. And I'm in my house on Union Street. I'm only 31. All right. <laughs> and Paul, I heard these words. This isn't it. <gasps> this. Holy smoke. I didn't go, who the fuck said that? You know, yeah. who's, I didn't say that. Because I heard him. This isn't it. And my fear was, am I going to have to give this all up? I was flat broke three years ago. And that yeah. wasn't it either. So Marshall and I had been taking a class called the Knowing Seminar. Okay. And what you did is that you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the iteration of this. You close your eyes, you quiet your mind, and you ask a question and you wait for the answer. You don't go there and write a list of the pros and cons. No, you ask knowing source you present it there and wait for something to come back okay well since marshall and i had been doing this and that was the best thing i could do with this disconcerting this isn't it you know yeah. i asked what is it and paul 1976 75 76 this feeling of peace okay peace that was so deep i mean i'm a i was a drug dealer those phones ring I mean, I lived in a life that briefcases full of money, fake names. You know, nobody knew what I was, you know, they shouldn't. All right? And the, the attention level was like this. And the feeling of peace was, whoa, it was so deep. And then I thought, wow, if writing those little affirmations down and putting my cards got me all this stuff, maybe they'll get me peace. So I wrote this thing, you know, like that, blah, blah, blah. And this is how my life is. This is why if people can take anything from our, your life is not going to be like mine. Mine not going to be like yours because we learn in different ways. We have different modalities. We have different and at different times. But this is what happens. So I've got now by affirmations, including peace. I am one with the universe. I'm everywhere at once. I remember when I wrote, I am everywhere at once. I stole that out of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And I remember after I stole, I go, what a kind of an idea is I am everywhere at once. But it was in Jonathan Levy Siegel. So I wrote it down. All right. Try imagining that. I'm everywhere at once. But I, 1976, I had nothing else to do. I was retired. Three months later, four months later, I'm at Marshall's real estate office because they had Monday mornings where they get everybody together and everybody's doing affirmations. It's because Marshall, everybody's, Marshall real estate company was chewing up real estate in San Francisco. All right. Chewing it up. And everybody's doing affirmations. So I'm sitting there, and this guy, this couple comes in, and he said, we're working with affirmations too. The affirmation we're going to work with today is, I am entitled to miracles. That's a good one. I was stunned. So I went up to him after class, and I said, where did this come from? He said, this is from a book that was just published. And he opens it up. And it was the Course in Miracles. And this was the forward. Now, you got to realize I've been doing affirmations about peace for around three or four months. This is the forward. This is a manual for peace. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is up to you. Free will does not mean you establish a curriculum. It merely means you choose what to take at a given time. This course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love. For that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing your blocks to your awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. 
The opposite of love is fear. Mm. However, that which is all-encompassing has no opposite. This course can be summed up as follows. That which is real can never be threatened. That which is unreal does not exist. Herein lies the peace of God. Yes, that's a deep, beautiful opening to the book. I have the Course of Miracles in my library. I've looked into it many times. You know, these are deep things. One of the things that, um, a couple of things that came up as you were sharing is um, you talked about how people are often unconscious of what's coming through them. And, you know, when I, I've studied a lot on myth and what, what keeps coming up over and over again is that myths aren't something we think of. Myths come through poets. They come through musicians. They come through mystics and visionaries and artists, you know, and, you know, the, the artist isn't looking up at God for the piece of art or, or why look up? You just draw it. It comes. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're a vessel, a channel, you know, you're right. And so I think what I'm trying to drive at is if there's people in the world right now that you think are channeling in the new myth, what do you see coming? And do you think that there are people out there that may be carrying pieces of our new myth, but they just don't even know it? That's very good. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, you know, I sort of made my reputation about the economic. That's when Jeffrey found me and I was all over the Internet, you know. I, I predicted the crash a year and a half before it happened, and I became one of the top people writers on gold and silver sites around the world. That's where Jeffrey found me. And what people would ask about what was going to happen, my answer would be sort of like this. The tree is being sawed at the base. It's very weak, and it's going to fall over. It's inevitable. The, tr the, 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 the root structure is rotting. It's grown. It's outgrown its, its usefulness. But I cannot say when it's going to fall or what direction. All right. Now, what I what, found, what is the what is the tree symbolizing? Because that's a our, grand our, our way our way of life. Okay, our way of life. Yeah, our way of life. Okay. Because I, I, I needed to know if it's our way of life or life itself. No, no, life itself is moving. It's pushing up. Okay, life itself is breaking through. Life itself has. We've constrained the life force in us. We see our exterior reality holding us back and controlling us. The truth is we have done that to ourselves. And we, we, we project that on everything around us because that's what we're experiencing. Right. All right? Yeah. So and the so, Ouroboros is shedding its skin, really. Oh, that's what it is. And it's very, very... It's, it's, it's scary to the part of the snake that thinks it's the skin. Yes, very much so. Yeah, I, I like that analogy. It's very okay. true. I, I remember when I was in, this is 1970, uh, 80, and I remember the exact time it happened. I was in Japan. I was trading in China. I had a rug company. Okay, I was been out of China. That was pretty amazing <laughs> what happened, all right? And and I'm at the Intercontinental Hotel, very fancy hotel in, in Japan, all right. And on like 28th floor, very China modern. or Japan? And it's so industrialized. Oh, you're, you're now I'm, you're in Japan. And I'm in Japan. It's this hotel. Okay, you're talking about China. Then you switched to yeah, Japan. I'm about to fly you. into China the next day. Oh, okay. And in 1980 in China, they had everybody was riding bicycles. Everybody was still riding bicycles. Oh. Sounds like Denmark. <laughs> I was there, oh, this is great. I was there when there were camels in the street. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I was there when everybody was forced to wearing blue mouth suits. Oh, blue, wow. okay, mouth, I mean, I was there in 76 before the Red Guard fell, before Mao Zedong fell. All right? So I'm about to fly into this country that's barely coming out of a feudal age. I mean, I'm in a very, the most sophisticated East Asian industrial powerhouse. And I'm reading The Course in Miracles. Right? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> right? And this is what it said. Because of who you are, 
if you wanted to be happy, you would be. And my mind goes, fuck you. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. That certainly doesn't sound logical to me. All right. Yeah. But of course, had asked questions and answered them that were far beyond my realm. So I kept going. All right. Uh-huh. I got time to kill. All right. So it said, perhaps you should ask why you haven't asked. Mm, that's a good one. That's this, very is a, good this, one. this sounds very much like the I Ching, you know. Oh, I oh, I'm into the I Ching. I'll tell you, I I I've got some stuff in the I Ching. It'll blow your mind. So I'm sitting there and I close the book and I close my eyes and once again ask the question. As absurd as it appeared to me, why haven't I asked, truly asked to be happy? Paul, the answer was immediate. Immediate. The answer was, I was afraid of dying. And I uh, knew it wasn't physical death. It was my sense of me. And that's why I knew at that point, I mean, I had given up meat at certain times. I'd, you know, done meditation practices. I'd read. I'd, you know, I, I saw myself as a seeker. And I knew, Paul, if the door to enlightenment would be was over there to my left, I'd be looking there to the right, to the right. I'd be looking up. I'd be looking everywhere except where the door was because I was afraid to go through it. All right. And that was a fear I didn't even know I had. Mm, yeah. So when you ask the question, what is in the way? Where is the free will? How do we get through this? My conclusion, my working assumption is, were it not for it, we'd be up shit creek. But it is taking care of us. But where we are, and we have to open that relationship, because that's what you said there about becoming one with it. But it only happens in its time. We are the most impatient because the pain is horrible. The dissociation, living in a dissociated state, in an apparently Separated, dissociated state is painful as only human beings can know. This is a terrible experience. So speaking of that, if source is source, there can only be source. Therefore, source is all-knowing, can't know itself until it creates the illusion of other. That's why this got set in motion, all right? It did something rather extraordinary, according to my data. Yeah, yeah. According to my data, it played itself out. That's that's my point. See, this I want to I want to just I want to ask you a question to to let you expand on it because this is a very important thing. A lot of people have this idea that God's perfect, God's out there somewhere, and we're down here. And I I you know, I meditate deeply on these things. I say, look, if you knew everything, you wouldn't think about anything. And the analogy I give my students is, look, do you walk around trying to remember how to tie your shoe or you just know it? Well, of course you don't think about it. You just know it. If God knows everything, then God's not thinking about anything. Therefore, the only way God can really know if God knows is to experience what God knows. Right? A, a, another analogy I give is if you go to medical school for four years to become a heart, a cardiac surgeon, and all you've done is sit in a laboratory or in a, in a classroom and study. And the day you go to do your first surgery, they wheel your mother in having a heart attack. You're going to realize you don't know much. You're going to be afraid. And that's why they don't let doctors operate on family members, because you don't have the experience of your knowing. So the paradox is, is that God, as an omni and all, can't know itself through experience until it creates a relativity. and uh, my feeling is, is that we are that. We are God experiencing itself, testing all of its ideas so that it can ex- actually authenticate its knowledge and it can authenticate what fear is and not going to authenticate what love is and it can authenticate everything at, at once because, you know, time is, is a necessary illusion. Or as some people say, if, if it wasn't for time, then everything would happen at once and we wouldn't be able to know anything. <laughs> So with my point, do you understand my yeah. point? Like, don't you think that what we're going through at its deepest level is God becoming aware of itself and that as 
God becomes aware of itself. It says, okay, enough of that. We got it. We now let's do something different. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I, my, my world, my who I am and why I do things is very limited. I mean, it's, it's, it's contained. All right. Mm-hmm. I know why I want to do things, why I don't want to do things. I'm, I'm in touch with that. All yeah. right. And, and, and at a certain level, I don't concern myself with things like the Arantia book never attracted me. And I, I absolutely believe the Arantia book is one of the channeled books. All right. Uh-huh. That explains reality in a certain way, but it, 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 it wasn't my, my path. My path is very personal. Um, and to sort of solve my own issues of what I have, what I don't have, what I want to be and where I am. And those issues are almost, they're almost contextual in the sense of, of real life situation. But one of the things that really, I mean, that brought me here was at, the, at a very early age. I remember, I remember this, Paul. I wondered what was going on. I just wondered. I was like, I remember, I think I was seven or eight years old. It hit me. What is going on? At, at a basic level, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm this kid and this family. And, and I remember talking to my mother and she's, you know, my mother, her faith helped her live with my father. Right? And in the <laughs> I've world. got one of those too. We have something in common there. Exactly. That scared the shit out of her. And Me her too. faith was the glue. All right. Yeah. And I remember the look on her face when I asked her, how do you know God's real? Right. <laughs> Her, it was shock and fear wow. that her child didn't know. Okay, didn't know. And I just so it was like when I went into economics. I didn't take the the Keynesian side of the left. I didn't take the Friedmanite side of the right. You know, that's highly polarized. When I got into economics, is what is going on? Mm-hmm. And I it it made. I, I parsed it in a way that I could explain it to myself and other people in a way that made me one of the top writers on the internet on this subject. And in the same way, the thing I think with God, except people have so many opinions, I basically said nothing about what I found. All right? Nothing. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. As you know, the season has changed, and we have a shift to colder, wetter weather creating yet another stress factor for our natural immunity. We all know the world has been buzzing with confusion and insecurity around issues of the world and what threat or game we'll have to deal with next, and such issues always bring family debate and challenge right along with them, as COVID exemplified so well. But many learn the hard way that caring for their immune system needs to be primary in their life, and the effort it takes to nourish one's immune system is far less than the challenges of being so caught up in the rat race that you don't have time to do so. If you listen to my podcast with any regularity, follow my teachings, or have my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, you know for sure I'm not a pill guy. Food is man's best medicine, as Hippocrates informed us long ago, and that's what I love about Organifi's certified organic products. They are not isolates, they do not contain synthetic ingredients, and they don't even have glyphosate residues. Thank God for that. That's why I feel assured that recommending Organifi immunity to you is a way to allow you to use real organic food ingredients as natural immune support. And Organifi immunity is something that my own family enjoys and benefits from. So naturally, I want to share these benefits with you. Some of the key benefits of Organifi immunity are it is 100% USDA certified organic, contains organic clinically researched beta-glucans, It has a delicious orange blend with low sugar. It bolsters immune response for everyday support. It offers antiviral, antifungal, and antimicrobial support. Each serving contains 500% of your daily vitamin C from organic acerola cherries, which are an excellent source of whole food vitamin C. Offers immune-boosting ginger and turmeric and contains natural food-based sources of zinc, which also support your immune system. For additional support and rapid response, you can benefit from Organifi Critical Immune. Organifi Critical Immune is a convenient encapsulated blend of potent organic herbs designed to take for immediate onset of acute illness such as a cold or flu, featuring Chinese herbal superstars such as Andrographis and Astralagus root. Some of the key benefits of Organifi Critical Immune are it bolsters the immune system for acute immune support. 
antiviral and antimicrobial support. It's designed for short-term use and contains four potent certified organic standardized herbal extracts that have been effectively used for thousands of years to support immune system function worldwide. Organifi Critical Immune is easy and convenient to take. To support your immune system, your family's immune system, and protect your health freedom, take advantage of our special Living 4D discount offer and get 20% off now by going to Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash check 20 and save 20% on your purchase using the code check 20 at checkout. And remember to spell check capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 to get your 20% discount. Not only will you be giving yourself wholesome organic immune support with both of these products, but you will be adding nutrient variety to your diet, which is always an important means of giving your body the nutrition it needs to support you in ever-changing environments and having long-term health and freedom. Additionally, kids love Organifi products because they are full of nutrition that tastes good. Enjoy. You know, when I sort of came out with my economics thing, it was like sort of happenstance. You know, my, I, you know, the, I heard those words in 1991 about time of the vulture. And I started, so it, it would just, it put me in that place. But the thing about, about spiritual stuff, in that same way, this is how I came out of the box, of my first way of coming out of the box. 1999, my friend Marshall Thurber, same guy who put the money for Course in Miracles and you know, Lazy Man's Way to Riches, my friend from law school, calls me up and he said, Daryl, I want you to read a book. I want to know what you think about it. And he said, but call Connie Kellogg. She'll send it to you. The book's called The Power of Now. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, this is before it was published in the United States. Okay. Marshall's plugged in. So I call up Connie. I know nothing about the book, 1999. I said, Marshall said I should call you. And he said, oh, Marshall, 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 you know. And, and, and she was his first publisher. So Connie sends me Eckhart's book, okay? And I read it, and I go, holy smokes. This is stuff that, some of the stuff I wrote when I was in prison in that state. Now, Paul, because of prison and the context I found myself in, I mean, I've been meditating since the 19, since 67, 68 on, you know, to a, but nothing like after 1985 when I was in the, when I was in prison. Yeah, you had time. I it was a focus. And what happened to me? I didn't expect. I didn't meditate to try and have that experience. I was meditating because I had to do something with that mind. All right. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I was there, and I knew it. I was in that state of one. I was there. In, in, and, in unity. and I wrote certain things down, which are in my new book. But anyway, and I didn't show them to anybody. I don't go, hey, you know, I didn't go to, you know, lunch the next day and go to the guy sitting next to me, you know, homie. With a, hey, homie, do you know what happened to me? I got, I saw God last night. I was talking to God. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> you know, you know it's, that's not the deal. But I wrote this stuff down and I read what Eckhart, Eckhart said, talked about the mind. And he said, we're trapped between the future and the past. The past is with its emotional tug and the future with all these what ifs, all right? And they pull us away from the now. I wrote these, these words I'm going to tell you, they came to me when I was in, in that state. Yeah. The future that never happens, determine what we, I do today, will a past that ever lingers be the reason I feel this way? Mm. That was it. That, ex- that was the same place that Eckhart said. Yeah, say it again. Will a future that never happens determine what I do today? Will a past that ever lingers be the reason I feel this way? Right. Yeah, that's very deep. That was it. And I didn't tell anybody that. I wrote it down. I didn't come out and... These, this is highly personal. But what happened is... Over the time, things came out, and I like that's what's a lot of this in my book. My life has happened in such a way that these things that have happened to me have also created the situation and the context to share them. I never started this to share. I never 
started this thing. Marshall used to say about Martha and me, he said, we were the only couple people he knew that had an 800, you know, toll free number and nobody knew what it was. Oh, that's a, that's, that's a, a paradox. You know, I mean, I was so edgy about talking with other people because I was so off the board. I was so, my world was so different. I mean, I'm a, you know, I was a hippie. We were drug dealers. You know, we lived in a world that we, that intersected, but it was, it was, not a shared reality. And I wasn't prone to even approach this thing, the greater, the, the, the people, the, the media. And it's only, but nature, but first with the books, with economics, that got me, and that was a very small focused, but it was international. I mean, when I put my website up in 2007, within three months, I had 10,000 hits, and the demographics were postgraduate education and plus 100,000 years in salary when I my book. So I made my reputation in money, all right? But what happened with metaphysics, I had been in that years before, and I saw what we're going through now coming. I read about this. I knew about the tree falling over. All these things, but these are things that I don't, people don't want to hear them. There's there it, 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 it scares the shit be Jesus out of them, and I understand it. I mean, I, one of the one of my friends, she said she stopped. She found me in two thousand seven, you know, on the internet uh, typed by gold and silver, and she said she stopped listening to me because I kept saying it's going to get better. She said, "How can it get better? We're headed towards the drink, you know. Go buy gold, buy silver, have faith." She didn't understand it. Well, now she does. Because she was able to make, but, you know, and so what happened is that group of people where I made my reputation, they're not at all listening about this better world. I mean, there are some, there are, just like there are some, I mean, Martha and I, for 10 years, we'd be swinging between this male, female polarity. I'd be talking, I'd be, I'd be talking in, 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 in Austria or, or Australia, 95% male, hard money. Austrian academics. All right? Three months later. Oh, money, buy me off. 95% women. Two different realities. Two separate realities sharing the same DNA and not yeah. knowing it. Right. Now, if I could ask, you know, the metaphor of the tree falling over. Um, in nature, when a tree falls over, there's still a lot of life to come. It becomes infested with fungus. Mushrooms grow. It's food. It becomes homes. It becomes a resource. And, and it basically just creates more life. Shock. The Hindus had an understanding of the process. And they, and they, they gave it a name, Shakti, the goddess of destruction. Out of destruction comes regrowth. Everything, what we are witnessing is the collapse of our present day institutions, which Good. include business, religion, Good. and politics. Good. All right? They're collapsing because their era is over. We've learned what we've had to learn through their through the experience. They've outgrown themselves and basically trapped us into a dead end. The reason why we're moving out of it is that its time is over, but the universe is making a move. Bucky Fuller, I, I don't know if you know much about Bucky, but... Yes, I do. Yes. Buckminster Fuller for all of you listening. Yeah. I, Marshall, loved Bucky. Okay? Marshall, after he made his millions, followed Bucky around for a while, towards the end of his life. All right? And I always sort of blew him off, an idealist, you know, that, you know, and Marshall was doing his thing, and... And in the late 1980s, Martha was at a week-long seminar, one of the last seminars that, that Bucky did with Marshall, all right, and uh, 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 Kirkwood Meadows. And uh, and so I knew who he was. Marshall kept talking about him. I'm blowing him. I'm real busy. I mean, I am real busy doing what I'm doing. And what happens is I, I, I made my economic prediction, which put me on the map in 2007 um, in a media sense, all right, Internet, stuff like that. And the next year, Marshall, we belonged to this group called the Positive Deviant Network, which was a network of people that he brought together because he wanted to see what happened when they came together. All right. Network science with deviants. People were off the edge. 
And we had a, it was, it was a Bucky game. It was, Marshall was doing, and he had us read parts of, of Critical Path, which was Bucky's last major work. And I read this part of the section, and I, it was, I was supposed to read it, Paul. Bucky said, I made very sure to make my predictions over 50 yards, over 50 years in the future, because I do not want to draw the attention of the powers, of the power structure who would find my vision a threat to theirs. A vision, their vision is selfishness, control, and power. All right? Bucky said there are two types of forces on the earth at this time. Class two, which is everything we do as individual human beings or collectively to improve our life, to do and to change anything. It's class two. Class one, he says, is source, is God. All right? He said... He said in 1981, humanity is entering a period of an unprecedented crisis, unprecedented, which is meant to transform us from our competitive, differences-based realities into a harmonious, interdependent whole with enough for all. That's, that's the future then. That's the future. And the crisis that he predicted in 1981, we're in the middle of right now. And he made an allusion to that crisis back to his own life. Bucky had a life-changing experience, all right, when he was 32. No, he's 27. He's 27. He was, uh, he was, he was brilliant. He was born brilliant, all right? Yeah, he's definitely brilliant. People giving him money, business failures, stuff like that. And he, he was born during the last play, like last COVID crisis, the Spanish flu, all right? The night is 100 years before, all right? Their daughter was born very sickly, spinal meningitis, you know, weak, you know? Mm-hmm. And Bucky was going to a Harvard-Yale game, even though he'd been kicked out of Harvard, all right? <laughs> and uh, uh, he could, he, you know, he was five feet two, he had a hearing problem, his thick glasses, didn't, didn't look the part of the frat rat. So they turned down by everybody. Bucky took the money his family gave him for tuition, and he spent it on showgirls in New York. <laughs> all right. he kicked him out. Did it twice. All right. Then he was kicked out with cause the second time. Harvard later gave him a fucking degree. All right. <laughs> and, you know. And but Bucky had had so his daughter was sick. He was going to a Harvard game, and and that was when you know you see on the walls like USC, Georgia. They, they're, they're, there's uh, uh, like triangles with the name of the school on it or the team. You know, they're, they're pennants. They're called pennants, but they were on canes. People had them on canes and waving around. His little girl said, Daddy, bring me back a cane. Okay. So he goes to the game. Harvard wins, comes back, and he's, he's in New York uh, at the train station. He calls his wife out on Long Island. He's taking the train back, and he at, calls her up and says, you got to get back here. She's sick. She's very ill. The doctor's here. Bucky gets back there. She's in a coma. Wow. He's holding her in his arms. She opens her eyes and says, Daddy. Did you bring me the pennant? He had forgotten, Paul. Uh Uh-oh. She closed her eyes and never opened them again. That's painful. Five years later, Bucky is drinking like the proverbial fish. His business has gone sideways. They bought him out, kicked him out of the company. And he's come to the conclusion that his life isn't worth living for his family. And he's going to commit suicide. He's looking at Lake Michigan, figuring out how he's going to do this. And the next thing Bucky knows is he's suspended 10 feet in the air, surrounded by dazzling white light. And he hears these words. Everything you think is correct. What others think about what you think, don't listen to them. If you will dedicate your life to helping humanity, I will take care of you. He heard those words, okay? And the next two years went into the silence. I mean, basically almost didn't talk to anybody. And when he came out, he was in that flow that you talked about, that artist. In fact, Bucky said, if you can write poetry, that means you're authentic because Mm. it's not the rational mind. Here a man who had one of those brilliant minds on earth knew the difference between the feed, okay, of the self and the big self. And Bucky said this, if it took that 
to change him, it is not too far to think of what it's going to take to change humanity. Now, Paul, I know this, and I've been holding this stuff in me, and I watch this stuff going on, and I know people don't want to hear it. I mean, we'd go to parties and, you know, for 20 years ago. You know what Martha would say? Daryl, shut up. These mm-hmm. people are here having a, wanting to have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, they, you know, I mean, if you want to talk about, don't talk about stocks with me. Don't talk about property. Don't talk about, yeah. I used to think about my son, my poor kids. They're trying to make their way in the world in the 90s, you know, optimism and stuff. And their dad is railing about how it's, you know, because one of the problems of seeing and of hearing, of knowing the future is you tend to see it happening then. Yes. You don't know time. Well, this interview is very interesting, and my book coming out is very interesting, because why? In 2007, when Marshall had that Positive Deviant Network, and I presented my 148-page paper, it wasn't a book then, explaining why I believe we were headed for a a cataclysmic economic crisis. All right? I I believed that, Paul, for at least almost 10 years. If you ask me, oh, it's gonna, you know, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to have it right after dot com, but it didn't, because that's the way I saw things. I was lucky, Paul, because when I wrote that book finally and put it out in May of two thousand seven, that summer the credit contraction happened across the globe. One year later, Wall Street banks fell. All right, I had predicted it on the money. Because I knew it? No. The Dharma of grace and luck. I believe my book is coming out, again, right before an even bigger thing is coming up. One of my sayings in the book, and I wrote an article, is what is going to happen is going to make the 2008 collapse look like an amuse-boucher, an appetizer. But it's, it's there to transform us. It's there. It's there to force us inside. Where I'm like that guy in 1970 who read The Course of Miracles, who said, "You're afraid of getting there, Daryl. You will not choose to walk through the door because you're afraid of your ego dying." We're all like that, Paul. I'm no different than anybody else, except I was told that because I read this book and I was bored. I was told that, but I believe it. I believe my life has been structured and ordered in such a way. That it made sense to me. That's what I was going to say about my friend back in, in, in the restaurant who did that book on on uh, uh, VW repair. He had read the same books I did, but in a different order, in a different order. Okay. And Paul, when he told me that, I thought that's why he's looking at it differently because I read him this way. So it's and I don't think it's by chance that you get your fee because. We are all led, even the ones apparently making wrong choices, are being led to look at and experience things that they're supposed to. You yeah. See? What What do you like when you take all the life experience you have, the the wisdom you've cultivated? The you know you've been through challenging times. You've been rich multiple times. You've been broke. You've been in jail. You've had spiritual practices without drugs. You've been on deep spiritual practices uh, with the drugs, you know, so you have quite a library of life experience. When you look at what's unfolding right now, I mean, yeah, you're 77, but you, you could end up living through 20 more years of this stuff. I understand. How how do you, how do you uh, center yourself for this? I have, Developed tremendous faith inadvertently. <laughs> uh, yeah. I did not start this path to develop faith. In, in my book in 2007, I wrote, in fact, one, that girl, the friend of mine, quoted it back last week in a group that we were in. These words I had written in, I didn't think anybody, I thought they were like throwaway lines. She said, Daryl wrote in 2007, buy gold, buy silver, have faith. And if, the, if these, Faith is the greatest thing, but and it's you might as well start getting it now while the getting's still good, all right? Mm-hmm. 
And that was 2007. My faith came from moving through my fears. Yeah. Uh, I, Paul, you got to realize, I mean, I look back at the things that have happened to me in life. I mean, for example, you could right now Google, uh, Google the words Penny Cooper documentary. Okay. And it'll bring you to a, a documentary that's on, uh, that's out, that's available on Penny Cooper. And it's just called, you know, but that's who she is. All right. Yeah. Well, I met Penny in 19, I ran across Penny in 1967 when we were first in the Haight Ashbury. And these uh, street people, basically, that's who they were. They're living downstairs. They had gotten busted in Berkeley. He had no money. He had a public defender. They got, you know, pulled over by a cop. Guy had a knife on him. You know, typical shit, all right? And he had a public defender. So my wife, Bammy, and I go over for the trial. This girl comes out, and I think she had braces on, but that's how we remember. Paul, she was like Perry Mason. I'd never seen anybody. Like her. I mean, she took the cop. And turn him inside out. I mean, it's like as if you were on the stand and she says, uh, Paul, could you give us your full name? And you do. And she, then she turns to the jury and said, the question you should be asking yourself now is, why did he lie to us about his name? And say <laughs> it in such a way that everybody's like, and you're going, I didn't. That's how powerful she was. That's how commanding she was. All right. The case got thrown out. I mean, I'd been in law school the year before, all right? And, in fact, her professor was my professor because she'd gone to Bolt. She was now just starting out. I was stunned. And I said, I said, listen, I'm running the food concessions to have on Ballroom. You know, Janice Joplin, you know, Cut Young Fish, Grateful Dead. I can get you in. She says, well, I'm not in, but my brother is. So that's how, you know, I, I put him on the guest list. Well, Penny became a lawyer, all right? And I had friends who used her as their lawyer. And this is when I was very minor. All right. And I became major. And Penny is becoming famous. And I'm looking at her, Paul, like someone who has, whose best friend has, uh, is becoming a heart specialist. And heart disease runs in your family. Okay. So she's getting bigger. I'm getting bigger. And I'm getting more nervous, all right? Is there a connection here? Okay. I get busted. Huge, 20 years later, okay? Approximately 20 years later. And I've almost got no money at this point. I've, I'm going through that thing, okay? Penny comes to see me, okay? She'd been in New York. I'm in San Francisco, San Francisco County Jail. Penny's taking my note down. We know each other, all right? And she asked my birth date. I give it to her. And she goes, like we are getting older, Daryl. <laughs> well, Penny was famous in, in, in criminal defense circles. She was the best. And the, the person that the feds were after, the Columbia drug dealer, wanted her for his attorney. Her. Penny went to the feds and asked to represent me at $60 an hour, Paul. She would have gotten. I had a friend who paid her two million. Yeah, she's obviously your friend. And I, you know, we didn't see each other that. We weren't hanging out, you know, over the years. And she did that, Paul. And so, and I, I realized this morning, my life has been so plexed. I've been so that I haven't even had the time to give the appreciation for the things I know that were extraordinary in my life because I've been so plexed. All right. But it's things like that that gave me faith to get through it. It's things like when I go through something, the right book would come in and tell me, let go, don't hang on. I'd ask the I Ching. A person would come. Things with that. Not all. I mean, I've had a life that I tell you, people would not choose from the get go. Yeah, you know? I understand. So I'd like to be enlightened. I didn't, no. I, and I know people, Paul, whose life experience scares the shit out of me. And they went through it and learned something, learned something so magnificently that they don't consider their that pain at that. 
And I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. So we're all in this. But that's where the faith came from. And I think perhaps if there's any one of the reasons for my dharmic path is to be able to say with a certainty that I did not have before, it's going to be all right. I mean, when Regina asked me at the end of my first interview with her what to say, I looked and these words came out that I had written during that period of time. We are eternal lights passing through temporal darkness. We cannot be harmed. We are love itself. But that's at that level. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, for advice for people about to go through this, we, each of us, is in that place that is going to trigger the emotions that we need to feel. The last thing that we want to feel are the emotions that we've been sitting on since time immemorial. No one wants to feel terror. No one wants to feel loss. No one wants to feel hopeless. When I got my tenure prison, and I'm in prison for 10 years, I asked again, the book, why are you there? And the answer was immediate. You have feelings of powerlessness. And, you know, which meant because I didn't want to feel those feelings, Paul, I actually got myself in a situation where I was powerless. Mm -hmm. And, and you it, had to feel them. And I had to feel them. Yep. I, I used to say prison was the monastery, was the cell I learned to share with my feelings. Mm. Once I figured out, and it was a hard way to learn it, but I'd rather learn it then, then, than now, now. But the druthers aren't ours to say. It wasn't my druthers to learn it then or, or now as opposed to now. It's in the dharmic path of each one of us. Each one of us is holy. Each one of us is loved. Each one of us is loved with a love that we cannot even imagine. And I know our imagination is limited. I've got a cement mind that has an aperture this big that is totally certain of what it sees. And when I said before, what I'm most grateful for is I've been wrong. Why? Because without that aperture being obliterated, I'd never have seen what I've seen. Hi, everybody. I know that you're all aware of the importance of vitamin C. There is a mountain of research on it, but not all C is created equally. I love Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex because it is the real deal, bioavailable, and I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, founder of Paleo Valley, why their Essential C Complex is so unique and something you definitely want for your family and your children. Autumn, tell us about your Essential C Complex. Well, I was shocked to learn as a holistic nutritionist that 90%, over 90% of the vitamin C on the market is derived from genetically modified corn, and then it's processed with highly volatile acids. And so I knew I had to find a better way to get all of the powerful benefits of vitamin C. So what I did was I dove into the research and I found the three most vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet. That's unripe acerola cherry and camu camu and omla berry. And then I just packed them into capsules. And the benefits are amazing because you're not only getting vitamin C, but all of the other wonderful benefits that come from these amazing superfoods. So to get access to this complex, all you have to do is go to paleovalley.com and you can use the code CHECK15 at checkout. That's lowercase c-h-e-k-15 and you can save 15% off. It seems to me that when I just ask my heart what's going on, it seems to me that we've splintered so bad into individuality that we need a crisis that's a common crisis that we all have to participate in together to find each other again and to see love and see God and forget about, you it's know, tough. yeah, you know, when you're really hungry, it's not so much about what religion you practice or what color your skin is. It's do you have something that you can share with me to eat? And and what can I give you in reciprocity? And and that's love. It's it's the give and take of life. It's the give and take of spirit. It's the flow. It's the flow of passion, concern, compassion, nurture. And I think, you know, people are so face in their iPhones and so distracted by superficial, technologically driven, mind altering, mind capturing. I think the 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 
you know, have you ever studied Gene Gepser's work at all? No. Okay. Well, you know, he was an expert on the structure stages of consciousness and he described how first we came from the archaic, which is the, the earth itself, the material realm. Then we consciousness woke up in the magical realm, which would be, um, you know, animism and uh, everything's alive. And, you know, we are with the plants and, and, and the animals are our family. Then we went into the mythological structure where we began to tell stories and try to figure life out through stories. Then we came into the mental realm, which where we got really engaged in symbolic expressions and imagery. But then he says, you know, we're, we're, on the verge now of breaking through and Gebser was writing this stuff in the you know late 30s he's long dead but the the emergence of the integral level of consciousness he says there's this merging of time and that it's like we can see through dimensions but he says if a person's not ready for it that the energy of it and the experience of it can literally crack them and it's kind of like when someone takes too much of a psychedelic drug how they go into a very deep schizophrenic experience and uh, time loses its linear, uh, its linear, linear, linearity. And you're, you're in multiple dimensions at once. And if you, if you can't breathe through it, you don't have an anchor in your own soul. It, it can literally split you to pieces. I've had to work with many people that have, uh, you know, unskillfully played with psychedelics and blew their mind. Um, but he's describing that we're merging into this period where consciousness starts to become, we start to become more aware of the multiple dimensions of reality that are interacting with each other at once. But ultimately, if we can transition through it, it, it helps us be aware that we are multidimensional beings, that we do have free will, that we do have more creative potential than we realized. So it's like, birth right when a when a you know coming through the birth canal is dangerous for the child and it's dangerous for the mother it's scary it's painful but it also is the precursor to a great celebration i i think i get the feeling we're we're coming through a birth canal and that we've gotten caught in the womb of externalizing ourselves into the outer world and into ideas but we've lost touch with our hearts and with each other i think that is the reason why this process is so traumatic. Because these are age-old fears, beliefs, and structures that we've clung to as a source of stability in, an, in a world, in a, in a consciousness that we don't understand. Thrown into it, out of the bleakness of whatever. Now, I believe there's a reason for that. And it doesn't matter whether there is or not. We don't have to understand anything that's going on with this. And I think what you're trying to affirm and get to, which I totally agree with, is that we're really a part of something magnificent, truly magnificent, Paul. I mean, magnificent that we only catch a glimpse of when our heart breaks open. And, and a part of ourselves is doing its damnness not to break open because it fears the shattering. And, and, and we are like the bridge of the chasm. I mean... We're that part that's moving that way. We're this part, and we're also gonna 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 fill the void that's opening up in us. And to us, the void is nothing's there, but it knows it's all there. So that's why when you say this, I what I know, I'm very much in touch with my fear of this. Like that's why I'm glad that I was so wrong because I led to some conclusions, all right, yeah. that mm -hmm. I had locked down. But my life propelled me through those fears. I mean, through amazing experiences, like the, the thing with Penny, or the people I meet at certain times, or just the synchronicity of events, like Jeffrey calling me up, the, you know, like, like, like that, like Zeus, out of the blue, coming in with this and the timing of the book. Like, those are, those are things you learn to count on and not keep track of. All right. You can count on the serendipity appearance of light. You can count on you. You can you can you can find the twenty third psalm is true. I Which is, wonder what the is it? I forgot. Psalm, Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, yes. thou art with me. Thou run. Yeah. 
they're true. And I think of that person who knew that, who could write it, not out of affirmation. I hope the shit that you're with me. I hope the hell that I'm not going to get screwed here. I hope that, you know, no, he wrote it from the state of knowing. Mm -hmm. And the part of us that read those words, Paul, or heard them, yearn for that knowing. It did so because we weren't, we knew we weren't there. Okay. Now, in my, one of my markers, I remember because I first, you know, I went to church and, you know, they, they say this, you hear it, and you go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I remember walking around the track in prisons going, 23rd Psalm, my head just doing it. Okay. And I was like, now I'm pretty cool. I look at those words, Paul. I'm cool. But then again, I've had this life experience. Of, of, you know, what it's like I said, that joke, uh, you know, the difference between an adventure and a suicide is the, the margin of safety. The narrower the margin, the greater the adventure. Yes. I've had rather an adventurous life. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I, I have. I've had a, a rather adventurous life. And, and I remember t telling my metaphor about it before is when I went through it, my drug period, <laughs> that was a long time ago. But and I had friends who liked that edge. I mean, I this is that's what I thought. And I thought, you know, I felt like I used to tell people I said, I felt like an accountant trapped in the body of a pirate. <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Hey, all hands on deck, maybe put that. <sighs> you know, you're swinging over that thing, you know? Because if yeah. you don't swing with that knife, they're gonna get you. Yes. Well, I was in situations where I had to be a certain way. I had to. All right. And I learned to be. I mean, being in prison was like a male finishing school. <laughs> That's you know? good. It was like a male finishing school. And I met some extraordinary people there. I'm sure. Because I was graced with, I was graced. I mean, and I spent a long time in that place seven years okay then i look holy smokes that's, you know but no it was it was different like everybody everybody who goes to harvard has a different experience every person has a different experience and i have i you know it was really funny i i i remember i was coming down off of acid 1983 and i'm in rome and i'm talking to this guy he's very wealthy i the year before i'd been flat broke I'm now staying at a, at a suite at the Hassler Hotel, one of the <laughs> finest hotels in Rome. And uh, I was at the at the Palatine Hill, you know, the Forum. And I know I'm not getting it, Paul. You know, there's that part of me that when I used to see art, you know, didn't get it. Now I much more open to it. And I was in one of those moods. I knew I wasn't getting it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, maybe I should take some acid. <laughs> <laughs> That'll I had, help. I had dropped in 10 years. Took a thing, stuck in my mouth. You know? Well, eight hours later, I'm pretty much down. You know, I'm pretty cool. I'm fucks, you know, like that. And we're out at dinner with that guy I met, you know, that very wealthy, very together guy, very interesting guy. And and I said, you know, I said, my life hasn't been easy. But I'm the luckiest person I know. And he asked this question, Paul. He said, What is luck? And these words came out of my mouth. Luck is love's reflection shining in your path. That's beautiful. They weren't my words. They came out of my mouth. I'm so glad he asked me that question. And I'm so glad I was on acid. Luck is love's reflection, reflection shining, shining your in your path. I love it. And that's the guarantee that we have. We, ha are, we have come awake. We are coming into being in love. We've carried into that dream our fears and our nightmares, which have made it appear the way it is. But as a part of that process, we are going to learn that our thoughts created it that way, so we learn to control our thoughts. And when we learn that our thoughts have created the reflection back to us of that nightmare, we will engage in those thoughts less and less and less. The one experience that spiritual people have had all over this planet is meditation. The Buddhists, the monks, the the Catholics, mm -hmm. the, the you know the you know the Hasidic Jews. Mm -hmm. 
the silence. Yeah, all of them. it off. Mm-hmm. Cut it off at its source. And that's where it is. And we're being forced into a place where we have to go there. I've been forced to the center. You know, one of my metaphors about life, people who have addiction problems or you know, end up on the 12th step, you know, because they took that step too far, <laughs> they went off the edge and they got to climb back to the middle. Life is sort of like, to me, it was like a, a, a phonograph with a record player going around. All right. And let's say it's 70, 70, 33 and a third, you know, LP. All right. Well, it's only it's going making 33 and a third revolutions per minute. But I tell you, the farther you are out of the edge, the faster you're moving. Yeah, absolutely. All right. What are nature's the ego? It wants to get out to that edge and to our detriment. But the purpose is, and when if you've really fallen off the edge, the people in the 12 step program know this, you have to climb your way back to the center and acknowledge a higher power. It ain't you. You have to let go. But what's forced you to go back is being off of the edge and flying off in your own life. So your trauma has led you to align with the gift that gave you the life in the first place. And if you talk to anybody who's had a successful experience with the 12 State Program, that's what they will tell you. The person I know the most who stayed in touch with God happened a long time ago. It was when I was in a China business in the early 1980s in the East Bay. And this girl comes up. She needs, you know, we, you know, we're going back to China. Like, that was very heady stuff in the in at that time. China was just opening up, right? And she wanted to work with us, so we asked for her resume. Harvard MBA, vice president of a major multinational corporation. What's she doing working for us? Wanting for? I thought, well, maybe she just wants to get into China trade and had a midlife crisis. No, she had had a nervous breakdown. Mental breakdown. Lost it all. Okay? All. And you know what she told me, Paul? How she keeps her center. She sits there and she said, I'm always talking to God, whether this is true or not. Now, you people out there may go, I want to be at one with the one. I want to be in constant. Yeah, you do. You're going to do it that way? You willing to do that? But she got a gift out of it that was amazing. She got there because she was she had to. Now, my sense is it's those emotions. The thing that's moving up is, is the yin, the feminine nature of feeling. The male masculine thought process has to be balanced in the heart. And this is what's coming together. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female. You've got those dualities inside yourself to a greater or lesser degree. Sure. Everyone is playing with the same puzzle with different pieces. And everyone is being given different pieces to put together. And you can only do what you're going to do. You can't do what you can't do. Some are only going to make it here. Some are going to make it here. Some are going to make it here. But my feeling is it doesn't matter where you want it. This love of it for itself is so great. You, even if you get taken off this time, you're going to be put back in the right place that you're going to be able to move again. It isn't, it doesn't end here. It didn't start here and it doesn't end here. No, it, yeah, it, it, I agree that I could go down a whole philosophical rabbit hole with that. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is what role do you feel values play as internal structures within the construct of the collective mind and the individual mind as a means of guiding one's choices or what indicators can one expect if they're stated or unconscious values and the choices they spawn are incongruent with an emerging myth and the needs of the earth. Uh, This is the whetstone of evolution. Yeah. This is how we make choices. And we judge ourselves and others based on the choices we and they are making. In truth, as Bucky said, there are no mistakes. There is only learning. So the values are, you got it down. They are the whetstone. They are the dynamic vis-a-vis free will, where you look at it from this way or take a position on that. And all the rest is a tumbler that only the higher self of that individual knows, not the egoic self. The egoic self that's making the choices and the higher self will not intervene. The higher self will not go... Hey, no, 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 don't do that. 
The higher self is there watching. The limited self learn by making mistakes, by going here, by going there. So you see, this brings up an important point for me that I want to put on the table with you. There's two ways to create your values based on what your ego wants <laughs> or based on what your heart wants. So I'll give you an example. Like a lot of my students, when I am doing classes where I talk about this type of stuff, because I do, I say, okay, what is your dream? And one of the most common things I hear is I want to be a millionaire. Now, there's a lot of reasons people want to be a millionaire, but most of them want to be a millionaire because they think it's going to make everything in their life perfect, right? So if a person like that establishes values based on what I would call more of a fantasy than a reality, not, not that it's not achievable, sure, but you know what I mean? Most people's desire to be a millionaire, it's like, you know. That's a lot of energy. It is. And it's like, you, if you can't handle $35,000 a year, what are you going to do with 350, <laughs> yeah, right? right? You're just going to blow your life apart. And, and, every, and, and look at the research on lotto winners. 99% oh, of lotto winners lose the money within a year and say it within made their life miserable yes. because it's too much power for them to handle. Yes. Yes. But then what I'm driving at here is, so I, I see that there's people that make values and some of them can be very ardent at sticking with them. I think Bill Gates is very good at sticking to his values. I just don't think they're driven from his heart. And then there's people whose values are really more centered in something richer and deeper. Like um, I can, I can use myself as an example. I've never been driven by money. I've known that money was necessary as a tool to accomplish what I came here to do. And I realized what I came here to do when I was 22 years of age and I've never turned back because I, once I, once everything clicked in, then it was as though I was on spirits river and to get off the river, create internal distress for me. It's like, sure. okay, my compass isn't, isn't pointing north. No, no, I just know I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction, yeah. which That's is why he said, but he said, Ever since he heard those words from God, whenever he tried to deviate and make money, yes, didn't work. So point being is, you know, I built my values around fulfilling my life path because that's the only way I can create happiness that's lasting in myself. And because I'm doing what I love to do, I'm making love every day. And without that love, I couldn't have handled all the challenges in my life, the financial challenges, the people challenges, um, the deaths in my family, my brother committing suicide, um, you know, a long list of these things. I've had very, very bad injuries, racing motocross and cliff diving and all sorts of shit where I didn't know if I was going to be crippled <laughs> or not. I think without, you know, I tell people your yes has no value until you learn to say no. And without a set of values, you don't know when to say yes or no. And without a clear vision or a dream for yourself, you don't know how to establish values because the values you establish to be a millionaire are different than the values you establish to teach holistic health or to uh, run a missionary or to uh, uh, be a permaculturist and and, and grow food everywhere. So my question for you is how important are values in general and for this world transition? They're at the core of everything. Nonetheless, this is, you know, there's a, there was an amazing book um, called the impersonal life. And uh, it was a channel book. And I've had it around for years, decades. And it, it's, it's in my book, you know, I quote extensively from J Joseph Benner. This is, and he, it came in the 1920s, 1910s. And it's God, it's Source talking to us. <laughs> he said, who are you? Who am I? You know, he said, you're me, you know, but you don't know it. All right. Yeah. And, 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 and what he's, because I think it, it sort of encompasses what you're the point you're you're digging around. 
And he said, you were like the oak seedling or, or seed that's in the process of becoming the tree. And he said, I know this. I am both the tree and the seed. And he said, I am the one who's leading you to make mistakes, to go down wrong paths, to try this, to try that. I mean, he said, trying to get rich is one of the ways you, some people are building up focus. All right. And that's all they're doing. Yep. They're not, they have no, it's all self-esteem. I, you know, they have things that, well, you know, if I, people don't, you know, I know finally, when I finally get there, I'm going to feel, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's what they think. And that's the element that's making them go forward. The ones who are dissatisfied with that become dissatisfied for a reason at a certain time. All right? And, and we cannot dissuade others, nor and we can encourage others, but it really doesn't make that much of a sense. I think, Paul, you have found out that you have been an inspiration to people because of your life. That they've made, they've taken it's something you've done or said. They go, that's interesting. Okay, I I can hang, I can hang on that. All right, but whether they get it or not is not really up to you. You say it, you you spread it, you do whatever, and so that's the same thing. I have. <laughs> you got to realize, I'm really pulled in, in as a person. You know, like. Even though I'm talking to you, you talk to all these people. Or I've been on Regina, and she's put me out there. I I'm not a, a quote unquote a public person per se. All right, my sense of the public was, fuck. <laughs> I, I figured people don't get along with. I mean, my worldview is too different. I mean, I I can have a wonderful conversation in an Italian restaurant about Osobuco. Okay, I could about how it's done and the the V. Yeah, I I could. But if I begin to move off in those other areas, we're like, like this. Yeah, and now it becomes the vax and the non-vax yeah, trying yeah, to it, find it, a conversation it, it, again. around. So I, what, I've been blessed with close friends. I've been blessed with my kids who could have just, holy shit, I their dad, you know, he's in prison, you know, that's yeah. my dad, all right? Yeah. <laughs> but they're extraordinary. And and in my and the friends, so I haven't had to do that. So my, if there is wisdom in what what do they call those things? Those uh, the the chemtrails. If there is wisdom in my chemtrails, it's inadvertent. All right, and because I wasn't trying to get wise. I was just trying to be happy or to to get free or to do something that was real personal. But the dharma of my life was bigger than that. My own little you know, scurrying here and there. All right. My blowing off of Bucky was ultimately going to be overcome by Marshall finally getting me to the place where I read it and went, holy smokes, this guy is right on it. You know, you've been tying him over 20 years at the right time. And so that's what it is, is that, and 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 that what I I found really interesting because after Zeus wrote, and you know and I thought wow this because I I got a sense of where you were, and I thought this guy's really looking, he's focused, he's, he's, there's a passion there. You 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 wouldn't have done what you've done unless you're like, you know, unless you're the kind of guy that almost burns yourself out at the age of fifty. All yeah, right? <laughs> that's you, you for are. sure. But that was that was your dharma. I mean, it was that was that was that was baked. In what was baked into me was not that. All right, my father had been really—he may have had an intuition that unless he forced me, that kid wasn't had the, wasn't going to do a goddamn thing with his life. All right, so yeah. he over he went the other way. All right, maybe that's what it was. But the dharma of my life, the fears that I have overcome, the unorthodox way that has happened to me, the fact that it's that the. You know, Jeff, one of Jeffrey's listeners wrote in, you know, on one of my interviews about, you know, one of my talks. And he said, you know, I've been on this spiritual path for decades. All right. I've 
done my practice. I've done my meditation. I've done all these things. And I have never had an experience close to what Daryl describes that has happened to this drug dealer. Then he goes, but I like this. He goes, well, maybe that's for me to look at and my judgment. Because I knew it was rare what happened to me. And I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't trying to all the I never I never wanted to write a book, Paul. They did, they came. They my life has been inadvertent. And other people, they get there by being focused, by planning it out. I mean, one of the things I read somewhere in the in, if you balance your spirit and the will, this is what Source said. You will always know what's going to happen to you. And then he goes, then it goes, unless, of course, you're the kind of spirit that likes surprises. Right. <laughs> anyway. mm -hmm. You know, so just to tie this back, if I'm interpreting you correctly, you're saying it's good to have values, but no matter how strong your values are, you need to be open to the unexpected. Oh. Is it, that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes. Because what we're tr we try and do is find touchstones to guide us through. And like that's what I wanted to say about the positive thinking. That when Marsh and I got rich, I mean, we made bank. We, here were two people, and I know a lot of people have done affirmations all their life, and nothing seems to have moved. Martha, Marsh and I, I mean, there, you know, there, there we were, all right? And when I did the Course in Miracles, there I'm doing it at his class, and I'm reading one of the lessons, and it says this. Why do you want things to be a certain way? Based upon your past, you determine what's good or what's bad, values or whatever, and you determine you don't want the bad, you only want the good. It says you are in no position to determine what's good or bad for you. Right. Some of the things that you've enjoyed the most have been to your detriment. Other things that have been the most difficult, you've learned the most from. Yeah. The truth of the matter is this. You have a belief that unless you're in control, life would be chaos. The truth is, if you could but give tomorrow over to he who wants your happiness, for it is his happiness also, every moment would become an encounter with the eternal. Yeah. Wow. Every moment would become an encounter with the eternal. You know what I did with that statement? You know what I did with that, Paul? In 1976, I thought, what is it asking me? To let go. Mm. To turn over. And I thought, what's my control mechanism? Affirmations. So I let go. Mm. And I lost everything and went a quarter million dollars in debt mm -hmm. in a year and a half. And in retrospect, a more careful reading of those words would have been, if you could but turn tomorrow over to he. Because the only reason you can turn tomorrow over is out of faith. That's the only way you can do it. I had no faith at 31, Paul. So I did the next best thing. I let go and fell off the guts. But that was a lesson I had to learn. P3OM by Bioptimizers is hands down one of the most important supplements to have on you everywhere you go. If you're traveling, if you go to work, if you're going to friend's house to eat, this product will knock out food poisoning and almost any kind of gut disorder from viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever could irritate your gut so quickly. It's mind blowing. I have been using this product since Wade Lightheart first turned me on to it, and he's the formulator of it. And I've got Wade here to tell us how it works, but I just want you to hear it from me. I have all my clients use this. I try to get it to friends, to family members, because it is really like your own bodyguard. So Wade, how in the world does this thing work so well every time? Well, as you know, we're very research oriented and we have literally a university in Croatia that we do microbiome testing with our labs of PhDs to find out what's the most effective formulation. And we are quickly moving into the post-antibiotic world where we need to cultivate super 
probiotics. We all heard of super bad bacteria in hospitals and stuff that are antibiotic resistant. But what we did, we worked with a medical doctor that was able to take an aggressive strain of L. plantarum, which is a very aggressive strain, and then put it through almost like a BUDS camp, a Navy SEALs training, where we subjected this particular probiotic to a toxic environment. We ran a sine wave through it. And out of that survived only about somewhere between two and 3%. We then take that and grow it on very special food. We feed them just like you would feed a great athlete. You feed them special food and the probiotics develop unique capabilities. We have a U.S. patent that is so powerful, I can't read it on the airwaves because we'd get canceled. But what I can say is when you put P3OM in your body, it goes out and breaks down any undigested protein whether it's in your gut or through your blood system. And it becomes your Navy SEALs defense force, if you will, to go out and wipe out whatever pathogen might come in your body. You just need more of these guys to overwhelm it. It takes it out. It cleans up any messes. And for the last 18 years, I've been using P3OM daily. And I can honestly say, I've never been sick during that time. If I feel something coming on, I just double down my dosage take four caps every night. If I get a little, if I'm traveling, I take twice that. And it's been great. A lot of our people do it. And it's one of our best selling products. And it's available to your audience. Just go to p3om.com slash living 40, put in Paul 10, get a 10% discount. And if it's not the best probiotic you've ever had in your life, you get 100% of your money back. That's from us at Bioptimizers. That's our guarantee for you. Go get it. It's for real. I love the stuff. Thank you, Wade. You brought up a memory I had from an interview with somebody, somebody that was deeply spiritual and evolved, uh, was being interviewed by somebody else. And they said, well, if God is God, then why, why does God remain invisible? Why not just say, here I am? And the answer from the person being interviewed was, because if God did that, you'd have no reason for faith. And oh, I think I think oh, that's oh, quite profound. Paul, what I want to say, that, that rings something true for me. It may be possible, and I'm not saying that it is, but it may just be possible. The reason why we find ourselves in such darkness as we make our way to the light, that when we find that light, we will never, ever let go of it again. Yes, yeah. I I think because we are the light, you know, the story of Adam and Eve is a very good metaphor. They didn't even know they were naked till they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which also means they didn't know what God was. That's true. But now that they, yeah, but now that they've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and had a little trip to hell, they really won't forget what God is ever again. No. No. You know, and I think. Personally, I think in many ways, that's a metaphor for what's going on in the world. We've made gods out of money. We've made gods out of doctors. We've made gods out of politicians. We've made God out of movie stars. We've made God out of drugs. We've made God out of doctors. We've made God out of everything but God. Everything but God. You know, I I used to say that what religion has done is put God in a box. Everybody's got their little box. All right. And in religion, there's been truth in it because that's. Something, someone said something so profound that it spread. But after it spread, all the people took that and they put it in a box with their understanding. It became their box. But they said, this is not my box. They say, this is God. Well, fuck you. That's not God. That's your box that you put God in. And God ain't going to stay in a box. But nobody knew because nobody ever go, well, it sure sounds good. You know, the box isn't so bad as the nuclear weapons they built around it. Oh, oh, that that comes later. And the the blindness, 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 blindness. And until we're at this point where it's so extreme, there's this is a divine intervention. I mean, truly, this is, you know, the time when you come home and all your friends and your kids are there and they're looking at you and you're, you know... You know, and you've been drinking like a fish for 30 years, you know, and you walk in. In a way, Paul, the, what we're about to happen upon is divine intervention. But I, I want to tell you something that gave me hope, absolutely gave me hope. 
And I'm not a man that sees a lot to give me hope. All right. I find it, but I don't see a lot. Of it, all right. I was on YouTube yesterday and I, I saw a video. And the video, I'm going to give you the title Homeless Man Lost Millions Now Lives in a Tent City in Oakland. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm very aware of my feelings. Okay. I, I after I after I got in touch with the power of feelings, I very wa- I watch why I do things and say, and part of me sort of didn't want to watch it. We're all afraid of it being that homeless man who had money and ended up in a tent city, but it was sort of intriguing. You know, the story itself was intriguing. So I turn it on, and this guy's being interviewed in Oakland, California, and he tells his story. He said, "Yeah," he said, "He used that he, he for twenty years. He was a defense contractor." And uh, and and then and he had a million dollar house in Oakland. He bought a half a million dollar retirement place in North Carolina. Things were good in two thousand and eight. All right, and then everything went south. Everything. All right, and I mean everything. So he sort of scrambled together, and and had a health crisis, and and he eventually it got to the point where he had to move in with his father, who had. The house had been in the family for two generations. They came from a very wealth, you know, they had money. And then his father collapsed one day from colorectal cancer. His father didn't tell him he was sick. He held, he held, hid it from the kids, all right? So when his father died, there with the house, and he had nothing, Paul, nothing. And already, before he ended up his father, he was couch surfed on all his friends' houses. You know, they, these, you know, you can only do it for so long. Fish begins to smell. And he knew it. You know, he's not an asshole. So when his father, when they lost the house, and it happened so fast, he, he, and he, he, just, he happened so fast, he's in Oakland, where he grew up. So he found a place behind a hedge, all right? And he said, it was such a good hiding place. I mean, it was, you know, because certain things become important, all right? So you're following this story, which is sort of fascinating. And eventually, one thing that then, then he got colorectal cancer. Oh, goes wow. to the hospital, and they're trying to help him because this guy's together. He's trying to work, but there's no housing. There's no housing once you follow through that loop. None. Okay? He, no abuse problem. No problem. So he ends up in Oakland in a section that was just no – it was like free-for-all. Free-for-all. Police didn't police it. You know, it was free-for-all. Okay? And he said his life changed when a cop was driving by and saw him over the air drive – cleaning up the, where he was. And this guy laughed. He said, well, you know, this is sort of unusual. Homeless people make trash. They don't clean it up. All right? So he was seeing this guy cleaning up this little thing because he wanted to keep his life together. All right? Well, what happened is the homeless guy took him to the station. They talked to people in the city. And eventually, over the years, they've gotten a, a place of 30 to 35 people moving in and out. He said, they're all homeless, and many of them have jobs. He said, we had a UPS driver. A guy, get up in the morning, do it, and he didn't have the money to do house. To This is our society. But you don't know it until you're there. Right. And they knew it. And they were taking care of each other. All right? And it was so amazing. You, you felt, wow. They they police it. They they got rid of the graffiti. They do this little thing. You know, they, they have, you know. They're sustaining. They've taken responsibility. He said, when people that are ourselves get ill, we make sure hospice cares for us enough that they will go into a hospice program to die rather than in that, you know, that cardboard, you know, by the fence. This is the level they're living at. So I'm watching this thing. And the guy says, so you're running for mayor. And he laughed. He said, yeah. He said, and he talked about the property that the city of Oakland had at its disposal. But they won't, you know, he said, so I'm running for mayor. All right. And he said, you know, so I, I told Martha about, you know, my wife about this amazing story. And I wanted to see what happened because it was this year, 2022. You know what happened, Paul? He and three other people, they changed the date on the cutoff date to get their petitions in. And they kicked him off. Kick him off of being able to run for the mayor. Now, let me tell you something. I know power. My major was political science. And I know power is so important that those who really are interested in controlling things, democracy means nothing to them. 
people's free will means nothing to them. Lives don't mean anything to them. No. And money is only important to get you more power, to consolidate what you buy. I believe that it was no mistake that he and two other people were part of that. They had no recourse. Mm -hmm. He had a campaign running for three years. He was, it was done. I mean, the only person, I know the reason that I was not able to get any feedback on my thing about the, the, the CIA story and Reagan, because nobody wants to touch it. The last congressman, Frank Church, who took on the CIA, got beaten by a landslide. They made sure the church committee or something like it was never going to be around. So when I only heard about yesterday that Derek Sue, this great guy who's not making much of himself, who was talking about where the what we could do with this, what was possible, got taken out of the race, I thought, this is a done deal. They, the fix was in. The fix was in. And you know what my reaction to that was? That's why a collapse of today's political, religious, and economic institutions it has to happen. Is on has to happen. What well, you know? Just because we're we're getting pretty far along in our our uh, podcast, and I don't want to miss out this opportunity before we close. You know, one of the big concerns for everybody, and and, and I would be foolish not to say it's a concern of mine, you know, everybody knows that we have to have something as a currency in order to feed ourselves or whatever. And there's a lot of chaos. I've talked to many financial experts. Uh, You know, some of my clients are as successful as you can get in the trading and marketing uh, money market business. But there's no consensus amongst them as to what is the right thing to do right now. Good. Ka- Catherine Austin Fitz says cash and then gold and silver. Um, I forgot the other guy's name. He's a BlackRock guy that has had some good interviews out there. He says cash will be what will be important first, but then it's going to be gold or silver. Um, what do you think? What's your personal strategy for what we should be putting in our piggy bank right now if you have assets it's important to be aware of where we're at in the stage of this game of capitalism capitalism is collapsing capitalism is not the game of free markets capitalism is circulating credit and debt and we've we've created so much debt that no amount of credit can sustain it anymore that's why it's imploding it's been happening for 40 years all right the currency that we've got, the fiat currency, was the linchpin of that system, all right? What what is fiat currency? You mean- um, Paper, uh, unbacked paper currency. Right, so an illusion of money. It's an, yeah, it has a sense of moneyness to it. Yeah. Before a thousand years ago, money always had to have something of value. It could be uh, seashells, if you lived in a certain community, that you valued them, because you weren't gonna give something that you had your time or your something to somebody else unless they gave you something of value. And so that's what it was. Well, the, the game changed radically in, 10, in 124 when the Chinese came out with paper money. And it purported to be as good as the copper coins that were circulating before then. They didn't cut out the copper coins. They just said, our money, our this is worth 100 copper coins. Okay? The truth was they only had 37, 27 co- copper coins backing that, pe- that piece of paper. Yeah. yeah. But they figured no one's going to turn it in. And they were right. And when they got away with that, they just started printing more, and then the whole thing collapsed. This happened over and over again until 1661. The, the next Chinese, Chinese dynasty goes, fuck this shit. We're done. All right, too much. Came, every every everything fell, and what circulated in China as money was uh, silver ingots. They were like little balls, pure silver, and everybody knew it. They the state didn't put them out. They were just, and the Mongol dynasty was happy to have that happen. It was stable, and then the British came along forty years later, 
and said, listen, we want to buy your, your porcelain, your tea, all these fine things you got, because the British had all this money. Why? Because they were the ones with paper money in the East, in the West. They took the idea of paper money, they backed it fractionally with gold, but the iteration of theirs, money was only issued out of a bank, a central bank in the form of debt, in the form of credit. The only people who qualified for the credit back then was the king and maybe the British West Indies. You didn't, I didn't. As recently as the 1920s, Paul, if you had a job, you couldn't buy a car in the United States. The banks wouldn't loan you money to buy a car. Why? That's why Henry Ford did his own. That's why GMAC, that's why the the car corporations started doing their own financing because the banks wouldn't touch you. Right. The only people they loaned money to were governments because they had the, the people by the hawk, by the neck, the income tax, and their friends who ran the corporations and farmland. Well, in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl happened. It went to shit. So they knew they had to do something different. And you know what they came up with? Home loans. Home other fucking loans. <laughs> they put you on the hook for 30 years. You put a, a thing down, all right, and you pay back that loan for the first 10 years, Paul, 90% of your payments it's are going to pay the interest to the bank, not the principal. Yeah. Not the principal. 90% of your hard-earned dollars are going to pay the interest, and your principal is still 90% of what it was. At the end of 10 years, that house you bought for $90, $100,000, you still owe 90, even though you did thousands of dollars of payments. The banks rigged it this way. Yeah. They rigged it. Yeah. So that's now, what's got to collapse. What? That's what's got to collapse. It is collapsing. So currency, fiat currency is the government saying this is worth something, but it isn't. They pulled out the gold back in, in 1971. So I my my what I call money is trading coupons with an invisible with an expiration date in invisible ink. The reason why Australia and all these other countries are uh, emerging nations are having trouble right now because the dollar is so strong. Because we print, we're the fucking, we own the printing press until it ends. And until it ends, everybody's got their loans, you, loans of dollars. Our interest rates are going up because we're trying to quell inflation. All right? Who knows how high it's going to go? When I had my rug company in 1980, my interest rate on a $400,000 line of credit went from 11% to 24% in three months. Jesus, that's a lot. Two and a half above prime. Two and a half above. Prime hit 21.5% to quell inflation. Because they say they're afraid of inflation. Do you know what they're really afraid of when they say the word inflation? They're really afraid of hyperinflation. And hyperinflation is when inflation gets out of control and the money becomes worthless. This happened in Germany in the 20s. It happened in Zimbabwe five years ago. It's 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 one of the things that can, and they have no control over it. That's why they're ratcheting it up right now. So what does that mean to them? They're in. They're fighting a last ditch effort. They are. In fact, what's astounding at, in my book <laughs> that I, I read I, the section of your book you told me that goes through all of this. But what I don't understand is 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 the hyperinflation somehow a threat to them? Yes. They're, see, everybody thinks because they have more control than us that they're in control. They're not in control. They just have more control. One of my sayings, Paul, is this. Credit is no more money than power is control. You can have a lot of power, but you're not in control. Those people have so much power in us, they're scared shitless. Paul, I know. And they lie to us. They can't even say the word. Deflation. The word before the great before the depression. You know what the word for for depression used to be? Recession. They changed the word. They took it out of. They won't even say it anymore because they're afraid of it happening. Because they're not in. They have, and so, but that's not our point. Our point is you and me and us. What I would say to this is that people go to your heart. <laughs> I'm not. If, Phone A.G. Edwards, you know, you know, you know. Ask Liz Saunders. Ask Liz, you know. Tune in to see it. And they all have their point of view. And they may be right. But we are in a time of tremendous flux, of tremendous change. All right? We don't know how it's going to come out. 
My sense is the currency is going to collapse. That's why they say you can be in cash now, but eventually that is going to turn worthless. They always has. All right. They're going to reissue. They are going to reissue. All right. And if they reissue at, as a as a digital currency, like a central bank digital currency, that's the worth of both fields. No value. And they're going to know whoever has their money. I know. I To me, that's the biggest trap oh, of all. Yeah. It's, it's all so everybody and, and all the people who went into crypto, this is going to work. Fuck you. It was good that it wasn't controlled by the government. But let me tell you something, Paul. I don't trust individual people more than I trust individual governments. Look at the scams that happen in crypto. Look yeah. at the bullshit. Look at the crap. And everybody falling for that. It's human nature. One of my sayings is this. Until humanity changes, history will not. Right. You know, Paul, check. History is changing. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. So So to put some objectivity to it, what is it, what is the best thing to do? Is it food? Grow food? Is it uh, yeah, have, yeah, sure. have skills? Is it, is it, is of, it of course there is. Dockpile uh, uh, gold, oh, of course silver? I, Paul, I knew people back 20 years ago that were growing their own stuff. I knew a guy when I started writing, he had stockpiled waiters. Waiters. Because he figured you're not going to be able to get waiters. You mean All like right? waiting boots? Yeah. I, this is how deep he was into it. He did hydroponics. This is how, you know, he's probably had a heart attack five years later from being paranoid. You know? <laughs> I mean, this is, so I, I don't know. But I, I you know, and, and I know that growing food is better than not. And, and in fact, I'm the worst person to grow food. I'm, I'm the least handy person I know. Anybody takes me on, it's, it's, it's a burden. Okay, so I'm, I'm like those, those old Indians that either depend on public welfare or the you know the, the tribe going, uh, give them a week more, you know, or something like that. <laughs> so I can't say. All I can say is these are tumultuous times, and they're going to transform reality. They're going to be very rough. And oh, you know what about that guy, Derek Sue, the one who they interviewed in Oakland? I really thought that guy was wonderful. If we come through this crisis like he has with his conf- with his ability to focus and keep things together and know where he's going, we're going to be all right at the end of it because that's what's going to pull us through. People like – even though I'm sure it was a severe setback to him, I wouldn't wish that on anybody being a mayor of a city. That politics is the dirtiest game in town. Money and power is at stake. I wish Derek all the heartfelt hope in the world that he gets the homeless thing some people to look on it, but we're going to be forced to deal with it. We don't want to deal with it now. We're going to be forced to, forced to. Yeah, it's it's a, you know, it's it's really like a shamanic journey. I mean, oh, it is. You know, you you, you you hit it. The like I've conducted hundreds of them, and and uh, you know, it's something I've studied deeply and practiced and developed mechanisms for creating safety and security, but. Every single person I know with rare exceptions, I mean very rare exceptions, gets very, very nervous before they enter into a medicine ceremony with real shamanic doses because you, you can't have control. See, you I have know. To let go. There's no control. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the thing that has always anchored me is that I have a deep connection to my soul and I let my soul guide me. And for me, I have found that my medicine ceremonies keep me very honestly in touch with my soul because you get a deep enough journey and I've gone very deep. You have got to let your soul take the wheel of the boat or it's going to be capsized and you're going to drown in it, you know? Hi everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. I wanted to take a moment to tell you about a product that I think everybody could really use. It's Symbiotica's Activated Charcoal, which is a beautiful daily detox. Most people have no idea how toxic their bodies are until they get very sick. And if they're lucky enough to have a holistic physician that runs tests on them, 
they usually find out pretty quick. They've got all sorts of environmental chemicals, plastics from foods, bisphenol, you name it. I have seen some shocking environmental toxicity tests come back when I run functional medicine tests on patients. But I've been using Symbiotica's activated charcoal just as my sort of backup detox plan. And it not only tastes good, it works super good, but better yet, they've improved the formula. So I asked Shervine if he'd come hang out with me and tell me all about it. So Shervine, what's new and why should everybody consider this product? Well, it's a brand new product. Okay. So we moved it from the Myron glass bottle into 30 sachet tearaways. So it's versatile. Like a daily dose. Yeah. And you can take it anywhere you want. You're on a plane, you're out on vacation, you're out on the street, you're out at the bar, you're out at restaurants. It's put in your pocket. That's how we all use it. Yeah. We also upgraded the actual formula. We added zeolite and bentonite clay. So Mm. it's a trifecta of coconut charcoal, zeolite and bentonite clay. And this helps so many things. And as you said, so eloquently, we're in a toxic world. Yeah. We're in the we're in an industrialized world yes. where everything's off-gassing. We mm-hmm. have EMFs, we have poisons, there's things in the soil, there's things in the water supply, the food. We don't even know what the hell the food is anymore. No. This helps reduce gas and bloating. This uh, brings on an antioxidant style protection, promotes healthy skin supports liver detox so it's like almost adding another liver in your body yeah or it takes the burden off the liver yes which is what we want to do we want to reduce the amount of toxic load and burden that our vital organs are basically under assault with yes and taking something so simple that's delicious that's all organic Mm -hmm. is the best ever and also a really nice side effect of cleansing the system that way is you have less body odor Less yep. bad breath, which is where we exhaust all and our toxins. a lot of people lose a lot of weight when they detox because the more toxic your body is, the more water it holds on to to try to detoxify you. Correct. And if you're a, ma- if you're a man, you know, we gather our toxins in our gut. That's why we have belly fat for men. Women have it more on the, re- on the rear side. Mm-hmm. The body has a way of protecting the vital organs by yeah. stuffing all the toxins into in the fat. adipose fat. Yeah. So this is a very versatile product. I'm very happy with it. Best news ever. Excellent. Well, I'm super excited. I love the product. And it's nice to have a detox product that that powerful, that that tastes good and is not uncomfortable to take every day, which I think is really important for kids. So hope you enjoy it and cheers to a cleaner body. To get 15% of this product and all the other amazing products by Symbiotica, go to symbiotica.com and use the promo code L4D15 at checkout. That's symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com with the promo code capital L, the number four, capital D, and the number one five. Paul, you know what my prayer is? I've had been doing this prayer for five, five years now. Oh, my beloved soul, how may I better embody you in human nature and form, and carry out your destiny in my day with complete cooperation and co-creation. I think that's just the perfect way to to bring our session to a close. I, I would love it if you would say that again. Oh, my beloved soul, how may I better embody you in human nature and form and carry out your destiny in my day with complete cooperation and co-creation. That's exactly what, what I work on every day. It's what I do my best to teach people. It's, uh, you know, I'm giving a, a workshop on November the 4th and 5th on how to use tarot as a medium, a language for your soul to communicate with you so that you actually have a way to get more than just a whim or a thought, you you can actually use the archetypal language. It's like we got 26 letters in the alphabet. You got 22 major arcana and 78 cards. So once you learn to use tarot, you can ask your soul a question and it can guide you. And and so, you know, I, I, I've been using tarot for years with tremendously good results and it's taught me a lot and it's really deepened my relationship with my soul. And I don't need to use tarot because I've grown in my relationship where I can just empty my mind and ask my soul and it talks to me just like I listen to you or anybody else and it shows me visions and but but I I found that in my growth and developmental process first I I found my soul 
by simply, I'd read probably a hundred books on the soul and I, I got irritated. I'm like, okay, I've read a hundred books on the soul. And yeah, nobody, where the fuck is it? <laughs> nobody's ever said, how do you talk to it? What is it? You know, it's, just, it's, all this, it's just all this modern stufu, right? I'm like, okay, why don't you freaking tell me how to talk to my soul? So I got irritated. I went into the sauna and this is, you know, 15 years ago. And I sat down and I said, okay, I'm going to solve this once and for all. Because if, if a soul is a soul, then it can only be God that gives a soul because nothing else can give a soul. Yeah. So I said, okay, I, am, I, I, I just meditated till I was relaxed. And I said, dear soul, if you were there, give me a sign that's undeniable. And all of a sudden, all the energy in my body just went shooting up out of the crown of my head. And I went, oh, my God, what was that? I said, dear soul, was that you? I said, if that's you, do it three times in a row. And I'm like, I wouldn't even know how to do that. Yeah, that's right. And so I said, okay, show me what it feels like when you say no. Everything imploded, like someone Ooh. telling me a lie. Just, Ooh. I'm like, whoa. Whoa. Just do that three times. Wow. Then, I, then I, I said, okay, show me what it feels like when you want me to turn right and my whole body lean that way turn left wow. my whole body so i developed this basic language That's wonderful and so then i began letting my soul guide me and then as i went deeper into meditation and you know i, I already have some natural voyances that i got through 18 years of tai chi and so my soul began to expand and expand the language but i was drawn to study tarot because in my studies of jung Joseph Campbell, Angelis Arian, people that I really, really respect, talked about tarot with tremendous depth and clarity. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, this is the complete opposite of what the Christians say. And that means it's probably the truth. So I might as well <laughs> keep looking. <clears throat> That's right. So I spent years and years studying it. And I found that by working with it every day, which I've been doing for many, many years, and I have like a whole library of all my notebooks from my daily readings. I did the Egyptian system to work using active imagination to engage each of the archetypes and let it teach me instead of just relying on books. But I, I really found that that grew my, my language and my library, and, and it's been so helpful to so many people that I've coached through all sorts of health problems and spiritual crisis. So I think that we're at a time where we need to stop reading books about religion and we need to find our soul and let the highest part of ourselves start guiding us because it's like a shamanic journey. If you don't have the trust in the God that lives inside of you, then even money won't help. You know, that's why it's going to be so rough. Because the preparation has been in the abeyance of preparing. That the construct, you know, you, we talk about myth, and I, and I thought about that. And to me, we live in an era where we have our own superstitions, but we don't call them that. One of our major superstitions is that we're separate and apart, and that there is no real God, except for maybe guilt and some control mechanism that the church is saying and stuff like that. But we have no real experience. All right? Most people don't. I, it's my belief, Paul, that you were driven inwardly. Your soul wanted to use you as a vehicle, to, and it, it had its way with you. And mm -hmm. you let it. Yeah, you, well, you, I, I felt safest that way. Absolutely. You, I, I you, learned that when my ego's in charge, things hurt more often. <laughs> that's good. No, <laughs> it's real basic. Yeah. But your soul knew that about you. All right. And and you allowed your soul to do that. Now, there were times in my life where I, I didn't know that at all. All right. And, and and it doesn't matter why people are in the place and whether they're doing it or not, because my belief is this. It's not my deal. What happens to all the discrete elements of the I am that we are? It's not my deal. Now, I, I have great love for them in the abstract. I mean, being an Aquarian is really weird. I remember the church, the temple, the university, 
she, when she found out I was an Aquarian, she goes, ah, Daryl, you're an Aquarian, huh? You love humanity and hate people. <laughs> All right. But like I said, I can go judgmental real quick. And yeah. I'm not proud of it. All right, but I, I can go there sooner than than I should. And but I firmly believe, Paul, that the it that is in me that pushed me and guided me through this process is in every one of us. All right? And our free will is to listen or to not. Our free will is to align with the values of life or to go contrary to it. It may be so big that even those that are going contrary to it will learn something by that path. Sure. That's what the law of one says. Pain is a great teacher. <laughs> yeah. It says they will learn by the path of selfishness. It's a very hard path. Yeah. And at a certain dimension, those who have chosen that path because it is their path to do so they feel it, will move back and join the flow because they can't go any more. They yeah, that's the carriers of mastery, of the, yeah. but they the carriers can't. Carriers of the negative clarity. Yes. Now, it is also possible that those who are so against the flow will have to be sequestered forever. One of the books that I've read said that, about from source, that it had to take responsibility for the parts of itself that didn't want the light. That didn't want the light. And he calls these denial spirits. He says they're, they're just there. They're denying everything. And he says they will even deny that they don't want the light. <laughs> all right? And so the all these people trying to help them. They don't want it. He said, I am going to give them their wish. One. They will not be able to exist on the earth plane anymore because of the danger that they pose to the earth itself. They are going to be removed and taken to planes where they can still play out their, their games of duality until they learn better. But they will. I'm not going to allow them to destroy the earth. That's that. And he said the other thing is this, that they, that the den denial spirits, will be taken off and go. And he said, to you, it may seem like hell. Let me assure you, to them, it won't be. This is what they want. They want the fight. They want the they want that chaos. Mm -hmm. Their spirits Sounds like chaos. George Soros to me. <laughs> it may be. Well, you know, I, I, I don't spin on that one. I'm and just, I don't. I'm just well, making a joke. I know you are, but this is, this is what it is. I believe, Paul, that the forces that are trying to break it away are so subtle that they will use try they will use dynamics that we all know to be true in a way that's not for example there was no person more cynical about power than i am no one i don't even vote I don't either. <laughs> I vote with my act with my dollars. In nineteen, I, I majored in political science, and in nineteen sixties, I knew who the real enemy was: the Republicans in the United States, the bankers and the military. They were the deep state. They were the deep state, and I knew the Democrats had a soft spot for heart and for peace, and I knew they were too weak to stand up against the Republicans. So I just didn't play. Yeah. And I knew when push came to shove, the Democrats would be of no help in defending me against the Republicans. And they weren't. During Bill Clinton, during so I know how the game is. All right. Sure. I know about Big Pharma. I know about Tamiflu. Tamiflu was constructed by Gilead Sciences. The chairman was George Schultz, Reagan's boy, Secretary of State. Don Rumsfeld succeeded him. At Gilead Sciences, Secretary of Defense, what the hell were they doing in a health services company? What right. the hell were they doing at Gilead Services, who sold millions of bogus flu things to the government, the United States, and England that were never used? All right. But when COVID hit, I was, all, you know, I, I'm on the news. I watched this shit come down. And I knew about SARS and what it had done to China and what it had done to China. 
they were freaked. They knew this stuff was like, it could go like that. All right? And when it came out, I went, ugh. And I'm a person, for example, I didn't even have health insurance until I was in the 50s, in my 50s. All right? That's how risk-taking I am. When flu shots came along, ah, yeah, yeah. Never. It never was a toss-up. But this is how the universe treated me. I'm about to go to eight, to the UK in April, in 2020, when COVID hit. I'm going to give a talk there. Things are getting dicey. All right? And what I, what I had was, I'm watching it. Who was in the highest risk group for COVID for mortality? Men over 65, high blood pressure. That's what I read. Okay? Well, I was fucking. But I didn't have high blood pressure. And that week, I go see my doctor, my annual checkup. And the girl goes, Daryl, you got high blood pressure. I go, oh, I still have high blood pressure. Then let's do it again. Motherfucker. I got high blood pressure. I'm now in the bullseye. Mm-hmm. I'm now in the bullseye. So I, when it came, I took the shot. And we asked our psychic, who I totally trust. We deal with people who, are, who speak to that side at a level that, may, I mean, a major level. And we asked her about the trip to Europe. She said, well, you may be able to go. You can go. But you may not be able to come back. Yes. <laughs> close the borders. Yeah. All right, what? All right. So Martha and I still have tickets on Virgin Air held until December 23. All right? Held. And she said, so as you watch this thing come out, it says, the thing you're going to do is you're going to go along with the flow because that's what society needs to do to protect itself. But you're all right. So that's what we've done. We've hunkered down. We've cut everybody off. I mean, except you coming in here. I mean, when we went to see, when we went to see the first time I talked to Regina, Martha and I weren't going to see anybody. But this is Gaia. This is Regina. All right. So we called up her psychic. All right. <laughs> what should we do? Yeah, it's going to be all right. All right. So we went back. We saw, we fell in love with Regina. It was great. We didn't get it. But that's how tight in we are. We, we we cut off almost all, but I basically, I like I told you before, very private, all right? So as long as I've got my friends, my thoughts, my, you know, I, I'm cool. All the other extraneous stuff that other people who is their dharma to need, I was sort of built for this crisis, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I told people when this is over, they're going to say about Martha and me, Daryl, you're going to go, I think they've got... Um, PCS. What does that mean? Post COVID stress. Mm. That we're not seeing people. We're still not going to party because we don't want to. All right. It's turned into a great excuse for us. But the truth is, we, it is only one of the crises that are facing this earth the economic, the, the failure of religion, the war. I don't know if you read that little bit in there where I talked about Ukraine. Uh, I don't know. I read the poem. It was beautiful, by the way. Yeah, is that your poem? Is that, beautiful. Who is the but poem li- by? Your mother? No, my wife. That's Martha. Oh my God, that's beautiful poem, isn't it? It, Paul. It came. It came out of her when I was finishing the book. Wow. She doesn't sit around and write poetry. She's a sculptress. She's just incredible. All right, but that poem it belonged at the end of the book. Yes, my mother's a sculptor. See. That's that thing. It's yeah. that. See, and that the 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 feminine side. We're in a duality that needs each other. Sure, we are. Yes, I mean needs each other, but the duality has been afraid of each other since time immemorial, for different reasons, and we're being compressed to move past that to survive. Because in the new world that's going to come, that that I absolutely go back to that hippie shit, peace, love, joy, the Aquarian age, it's good. You know, when I was there in the 60s in, in the Haight-Ashbury, the, all the talk was there about the Aquarian age. They didn't tell us. They did. Uh, Edgar Casey did. But we didn't quite know how difficult the birth was going to be. And let me tell you something, Paul. We were fools. 
We were fools at a level that people don't understand. You know, you asked, I thought about this thing because you were going to bring up money on this thing. You asked me about money. And I thought, Paul, you're going to ask somebody who, in 1971, I had this restaurant. This is the one where, where Jeffrey came in, okay, in Berkeley. Great Shanghai Steel and Ironworks, all right? Organic, you know, organic rice, you know, pineapple, instead, can, fresh pineapple instead of canned pineapple, honey instead of sugar. We're all doing that, okay? Natural foods, all right? And then we're reading all this Eastern stuff, you know, autobiography of Yogi and oh, and you know, all this stuff, and a lot of vegetarian stuff's going through it. So we're thinking, should we become vegetarian? I mean, this is, you know, we're at a, at a tur- Christ roads. So we had a meeting of, of, of us in the restaurant. And there we are. Should we do this now? Now, Zenny, who later became the personal chef to Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, is one of our cooks. And she says, we can cut out beef and pork. But if we cut out chicken and fish, we're going to go broke. And you know what my answer was? If money is the only reason we're serving chicken and fish, that's the lowest reason of all. Yeah. We went vegetarian, and a year later, we were broke. Ah, she was right. So the fact that you're asking me about money, ironically, that's my caveat. Take it with a grain of salt, no motor sodium glutamate, you know, fresh water, oh, money, pod me hum. We're all, I mean, Paul, it's, 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 you know what? You, you gave me the room to run around this little kennel that I live in. And I want to thank you for that. Yeah, well, thank you. It's interesting that your your comments about money, yet you're famous for your knowledge about money. So there's, <laughs> that's, money. That's, that's quite a paradox. Oh, and, 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 you know, you've been rich and you've been poor multiple times. So you certainly have a lot of wisdom about money. I, I've seen it. I, you know, and, I, and I, you know, I'm in my nasty, this is, you know, because I've said a lot of stuff from, you know, that really came through pure, you know, mm-hmm. and this is not one of them. <laughs> I want to frame it. This is not one of those things about God. I said, you know, you know, God really loves you when he gives you the petty shit as, as well as the big stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and your, your, new, not from the light. your new book is, is it docking on the mothership? Do I have the title? Docking. Right? Docking at the mothership. Docking at the mothership. When do you Notes expect it? Notes on going home. It's coming out between now, probably in November. You know. Oh, oh good. And so it's fairly, give, fairly I was soon. talking with Penny about this. We're probably we're going to give a fifty percent discount to the end of this year, and then it'll go to the regular price. But that's what it is. It's it's you know it's really my memoir in a way that says very little about my life. Yeah, I, I looked through it. There's a lot of very nice. I like it. There's. You can read it by almost turning to any page. There's little snippets. There's sections. Like the section that I read because you suggested on all the issues of money was very coherent. It was very well tied together as a nice little package. And it really explained. It was kind of like looking at the history of the the ups and downs of money and, and the predictors of problems. And I thought, what a, what a great education and you know, maybe a dozen pages. And that's why I said in the introduction of the book, I said, you can find my writings here just in regular type. And the writings of others are in italics. And I've taken excerpts from books that have been my guidestones, yes. my touchstones that have really meant something to me. And, and, and Paul, there's something I, I, want to, I want to bring, just because it just came up now. There is, if you go back through it, you'll find um, a section called the Ceratos material. Okay, C E R I T H O U S. It's the Serotonin Material by Michael Thomas Bucci. Michael Thomas Bucci. And I mean, I have stuff in there from The Course of Miracles, from books that everybody's read that's familiar. They may not have seen it, but it's accessible. I've been so, in, in, in 2009, after I wrote an article on money, out of the blue, this is when I was really out there. I get a letter from this Michael Thomas Bucci. Dear Mr. Shu, it has occurred to me in reading your article that people may be receiving information that they are not aware they're receiving. Mm. Oh, Paul, what the hell? All right. What followed was a series of emails between us that went deep. Yes. Really quick. Okay. 
And I find out later, in the early 90s, he had channeled a series of books called The Ceratos Material that had never been published. Okay? I found out that in 1985, he had been diagnosed in, in, with multiple sclerosis. No. Oh. 85. And that his wife, truly the love of his life, had died in 95. And for the past few years, he'd been living in a little town in Maine on public assistance. He used to have a company that made a half a million dollars a year in New York, public relations, until he got sick and all these things happened to him. All right? Well, when I put together this book, I wrote Michael and I asked him, could I quote from, in fact, if you go to my website, uh, www.drshoon.com, on my spiritual page, there's a poem and a, 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 Watercolor by his wife, Rebecca, on the one true religion, all right, mm. from the Ceratos material. I, that's been up there. You know, I've had it there for years on my website. So I asked him if I could quote from the, his writings the Cer- that fit. And if you go, you'll go back and you'll find them. And they're the highest, Paul. They're the, I mean, this came from a very high level. Yeah. And so in... In, in May of this year, he emailed me about something, about some problems that were going on. And I wrote back my little joke. And I go, this and this too shall pass, dot, dot, dot. And then something else will happen. And he wrote back with a little smiley face that, Daryl, that should be the name of your new book. <laughs> and that was in May. On July 1st, I emailed him asking if he'd review it because he reviewed my, one of my other books. And the email came back to me, no recipient at this oh. address. And I got that feeling in my stomach. Yeah. We had been communicating since 2009. He sent Martha Rebecca's watercolors and right now some of her little gifts that she had when she was died. That's how close we were. He had gone, I find out later, took his money on public assistance and had those books printed so I could see them. Wow. Okay. So we had that kind of thing. If when you go to my spiritual page, there's a, a thing called the Maitreya by Pat Aiken. She's this artist. We, did. we sent him this gorgeous thing, the Maitreya. All right. So we had that heart connection. But Paul, we had never spoken in person. That doesn't never matter. Spoke you spoke at the heart. We spoke at the heart. And then it didn't come back. And it took a month later for me to get the wherewithal up to Google his name to see if anything, if and a chance that this person who didn't know anybody, who was living on public assistance, you know? And what happened is that Dar, Darmar, Damar Escada, local newspaper, published weekly, had printed a huge obituary on him. Wow. That had a picture of him from the 90s. So I got to see what he really looked like. Wow. That talked about when he was at Berkeley School of Music, all things that he never told me about. Wow. But he had, his stuff is in that book. And when you go find the Ceratops material, that's how esoteric it is. That stuff there has never seen the light of day. Yeah, well, that means it's probably really good. It is really good. And I know you'll appreciate it. Uh, So uh, Penny will put any um, offers and things at the end in the podcast close. It's been a fantastic journey. I feel like... uh, I've got to sort of take a travel tour, not only of the world, but of the universe with you. And, you know, I would close by saying that if there's something that you've reinforced in me, it's be open to everything. If you feel scared, it's your reminder to go into your heart and ask for guidance from the higher self and know that no matter how scary it looks, if you allow it to do its work, it'll unfold the beauty that you can't see through your fear. Paul, what you took from me is one more affirmation that, that this, the, that because you distilled from it something of magnificence. You did. You distilled 
something I couldn't even have won. I couldn't even have thought that to give to other people. Like, Daryl, what would you want to people? The fact that that touched you in that way, that you will could see that fear is an invitation not to be feared, but to be looked at. And there's a reason it's there and that you you see it that way is wonderful. Yes, well, thank you. And what a great journey. I hope everyone's enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, when I heard your interview with Regina, I just felt like I've got to talk to Daryl because, you know, a man who's lived through the psychedelic era, he's been rich, he's been broke, he knows the world of drugs, he, he knows money, he knows the ups and downs. I, I just got a sense that I was meeting the real archetype of the fool and tarot, the man that lives outside of the consensus norm and isn't afraid to truly be himself. And that's so rare. Paul, I want to tell you, you know, that artist that I told you that we gave Michael Thomas Bucci, the, if you look at, if you go to my spiritual page, it's called the Maitreya. Yeah. Okay? The artist who did that, uh, I, mean, I don't know if you can see it here. It's, well, no, you can't. It's on the it's on the wall, but it, it's 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 on the it's it's stunning. Okay, she was a sculpture too, and Martha and I were her really good friends. All right, she was a handful. I mean, you know, I re I read somewhere I said if you think spiritual people are generous, you're going to find a spiritual person who's tight <laughs> because you're supposed to let go of the stuff. Well, you know, we all think spiritual people have no egos. Pat Agan had an ego like. And yet she was so evolved. She was so plugged in. She was so extraordinary. She was so talented. And she was doing this sculpture. And Martha and I went over there and she said, you know, no, it's a painting. It's a painting. It became a sculpture later. And it was a boat. And these people were standing up in the boat. It looked like an Egyptian boat. People were, these figures were in this boat. And she said, these words are coming to me, but it, it's, it's a negative title. And I don't want to give it that. It's, it's, she said, I'm getting the words, ship of fools. <laughs> and I said, Pat, that's what we call our friends. <laughs> that's what we call ourselves. Yeah, We're on a ship of fools. If you knew, Paul, the people that we met together in the Haight-Ashbury and what has happened to us. One person was with Jim Jones in Guyana. Oh, boy. All right. He lived. I mean, after, you know, they all drank that Kool-Aid. So my wife, we type his name in the book. He's alive. All right. And so years later, I'm going through a house. This is how Dharma works. I'm going, and I hear his name, Mickey. And I go, Mickey. And I go to the guy, I said, do you know? And he goes, yeah. And I said, I knew him in the Hayden Ashbury. He said, oh, you were the guy. He, Because he was a student at the San Francisco College of Arts and Crafts. I used to drop, pick him up at the house to go to school. All right. I said, well, I knew him. He said, I just talked to him. All right. So he gave me his phone number. So I called Mickey up. This is after way after Jonestown. I goes, is this Mickey? He said, yes, it is. He says, Mickey, this is somebody from your past. And he goes, Pat, you know, imagine what his past is. And he said, then he paused. He goes, Daryl. All right. This is what Mickey told me. And I used to think of writing a story about it. This is Dharma. Where it's just life happened. He was managing the basketball team, the Jonestown basketball team. And the night that they all drank Kool Aid, the basketball team had an away game in Georgetown. Perfect. <laughs> all right. So he wasn't there. And I thought of writing an art, a little thing called It Pays to Go Out for Sports. And <laughs> Yeah. So we have all these friends. Zeddy became the executive chef to Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. You know? And you talk about people pursuing pleasure. I want to tell a story about Zeddy. Years later, because we've all had that life. I mean, when I was in prison, Paul, Zeddy knew more people there than I did. Okay? So there we are later. All right? This is after she was working for the big time rock and roll and private chefs. And she's got a cane. Her back hurts. You know? She, I mean, we're all older. And we're at, we're eating at this really nice restaurant in San Francisco. Young kid, very good. You know, he's waiting on us. And we're getting up. And zenny has got her cane. And she's going out the door. And I said, you know what? That's what happens to you when you live life and you get to do everything you want to do. Yeah. And he said, maybe that's true, but I sure like a try at it. 
<laughs> and that's who we all were. Zenny died last year. We were that ship of fools. Yeah. We guard that ship of fools. But we are a ship of fools that are that found ourselves on seas as tumultuous and giving of life as they were treacherous and unknown. Yes. Hey. Well, thank you. What a great adventure. I really think that this is going to be a great opportunity for people to look at all sorts of parts of themselves. And and really, uh, there's a lot in the conversation that can open you up to a lot of things, which is what my dream was. So thank you, Daryl, and keep sharing your love with the world. Stay in touch. Um, when your book comes out, uh, hopefully I'll hear about it so I can get a hard copy of it because I'm a guy that likes to hold paper. Yeah, well, it's only come out in softback, but that's the closest I can get to it. Well, that, 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 that's fine. Something I yeah. can hold. And You'll get it. Yeah. And it, Paul. I'll send you a copy of my book. If I already didn't, I think I might have, but I'll, I'll get a copy of, I've got, this is my 12th book I'm writing, but I'll send you a copy of my most popular one. Good. All right. This Lots of love. Good, thank you, buddy. And, and uh, thank you to my sponsors and thank you for all your great products and your beautiful, sustainable practices. You're a great example to everybody. Thank you to all of you for buying anything from the sponsors that supports the podcast. And if you're still listening to Daryl and I, I know you're as committed to spiritual growth and development and living and loving as fully as we are, you wouldn't still be here. So thank you for being on our team. And uh, I look forward to sharing more with all of you soon. Lots of love. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Daryl Robert Schoon. You can find out more about Daryl's work and his books at his website, drschoon.com. That's D-R-S-C-H-O-O-N.com. To save 15% on his latest book, Docking at the Mothership, visit tiny.cc forward slash mothership. This offer is only good until the end of December, so visit tiny.cc forward slash mothership to get your copy now. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.